All right, I'm Eric uh, with Hop Stories, and I'm here today with Jesse from Abrosis Brewing School. Mm -hmm. Got that right. And uh, we're trying out this new thing called LiveBrew.tv, and it's going to be part home brewing show, part beer education, um, and it's live. So that means what you're seeing right now is what's actually happening. Yeah. Um, we're here. Right we're now. here. We're here in, in uh, Seattle, Washington in the carport of my garage. Uh, Beautiful sunny day. And we are, we're going to be brewing a pale ale today. So Jesse's been working on this recipe for a while mm -hmm. um, and he'll tell us more about it and kind of fill us in, fill the viewers in mm -hmm. on kind of what, what it takes to brew a good Pacific Northwest pale ale. So Jesse, yeah. I'll let you take it. All right. Uh, once again, uh, I'm Jesse Young. Uh, I, uh, I'm the owner and uh, person of uh, Abrosa School of Brewing uh, here in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I do uh, homebrew classes, so we're gonna kinda do like a live brew class, essentially, on how to brew with a three-tiered system here. Uh, we already have things kinda going already. Uh, we have our hot liquor tank, so we're heating up our water. We got our mash tun, and then we have our boil kettle right here. So actually, we're just gonna jump right in real quick um, because our water is up to temp. So I'm going to go ahead and shut off that burner because we don't want to get it too hot. Because when you do an all grain brew, temperature is key. Um, but what we're going to do real quick is we're going to go over, um, kind of give you an idea of what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to talk about brewing, the equipment that you'll need for a three tier uh, all grain system like uh, this. Um, we'll go over our recipe. Like you said, uh, Eric, we're going to be doing an American pale ale, pretty much a West Coast style. Um, we'll go over the recipe with you. And then uh, we'll talk about building your recipe, building the wort. Um, we'll go over briefly extract brewing. We'll talk about the uh, key pieces of all grain brewing, uh, getting your sugars, flavor, color. Um, and then we'll talk about mashing because that is a key step in the all grain process. Um, so we'll go over the mash temps and the kind of sugars that we're going to be getting, as well as a little bit on pH and then uh, basic water treatment. Um, and then we'll go over choosing your hops uh, for the right recipe. Um, and then of course, we'll, uh, the other uh, aspect of brewing is yeast. And so we'll talk about selecting your yeast uh, and going from there, and then also talking about starters. And I do have a nice little flask right here on our stir plate to kind of give you an idea of what a yeast starter will kind of do for you. Um, we'll go over a little bit of the uh, uh, anthropology of beer, because I do have an anthropology background. Um, when I studied at Ohio State University, um, in my opinion, the OSU. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll go from there. And then uh, basically that's going to be the uh, origins of alcohol um, and then the beginnings of beer. Uh, and then of course then we'll jump straight to fermentation. We'll talk about temperature control and then go over dry hopping. Uh, primary hopping versus secondary hopping and if you don't understand what that is we'll explain it of course. Um, and that's about it. But we'll try to go over everything uh, today and so that way you can see a brew from start to finish. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's go along with this. So basically I always like to start off and say, you know, what is brewing? And basically brewing is malted barley is soaked in hot water to release the malt sugars. And basically you're gonna be making a tea, a grain tea. So that malt sugar solution is boiled with hops uh, for seasoning. The se uh, that is then cooled and a yeast, which is a fungus, is added to begin the fermentation. Uh, the, the yeast will ferment the sugars um, releasing CO2 and ethyl alcohol, and that is the alcohol that we can ingest. Um, and then when the fer main fermentation is complete, the finished beer is bottled, and then if you do bottle, you'll add a little bit of sugar for carbonation, and then you'll be good to go. Uh, so, for uh, the brewing equipment, uh, what you'll need for a three-tiered uh, all-grain system is you're going to need uh, a good-sized boil kettle. Uh, this one right here is a 22-gallon boil kettle. Um, you don't necessarily need this uh, to get an all-grain brew. Um, but uh, you know you want a good size because you don't want to have a boil over. Plus, I personally like to have a bigger boil kettle because then I have the option of doing a 10 gallon uh, batch if I want to. Uh, the other thing that you'll want to have is a mash tun and that's where we're going to be soaking the grain in the hot water. Uh, a propane burner um, and then basically uh, a wort chiller because you are going to want to get uh, you know, your, your full uh, boil amount chilled as fast as you can. And so, uh, yeah. And then basically, you know, spoon, uh, you know, thermometer, and then all your fermentation equipment. So if you've already brewed like an extract batch or anything like that, you probably have a lot of this equipment. But if you're transitioning from extract to all grain, you just need to get a, a mash tun uh, for the most part. Or brew in a bag. Or brew in a bag. That's, that's the other that's thing. That's the method I use. Yeah. Uh, just get a nice big 
bag, stick all your malt in there, and mash in your in your boil kettle. Yeah. Works pretty well. And so all you need is basically this if you do brew in a bag. Um, so you don't need all this other extra equipment, which is nice. Um, so right now, as we're going, I'm just going to quickly get the water. I've heated the water up to about 168 degrees. And so that way, when we add the grain that we've already previously milled, it should get to our mash temperature of 153 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to go ahead and get that going. So I'm priming the mash tun right now and getting that in there. And then I like to do this little thing with my hose. Kind of gets the water flowing really nice. Bam. All right. So that's filling up. Now the one thing I will say whenever you're filling up a, a mash tun or uh, your boil kettle is always make sure that the valve on your kettle or mash tun is closed. Um, I've had hot water seeping on my foot uh, from time to time because I've forgotten all that. So um, yeah. And so uh, today, uh, like we said, we're going to be making an American Pale Ale. Um, that's just a really easy, basic uh, style of beer that you can brew uh, as your first batch. Um, you can do it extract, you can do it all grain, brew in a bag and all that, but it's, you know, it's a style of beer that everyone is familiar with. Um, think of, you know, like the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, the classic West Coast style uh, Pale Ale that really kind of uh, took off the uh, craft beer scene back in the early 80s and such. Um, uh, w one real uh, quick thing I do want to talk about is that, so the difference between an American Pale Ale uh, and an English Ale is usually defined by the ingredients. Uh, English pales are nutty, more robust due to the use of British pale malts, um, while the American malt gives a softer and somewhat crisper feel um, to that. American Pale Ales are awfully, uh, slightly less balanced, showing a stronger hop profile. Um, with ours uh, than their English counterparts. Uh, and then the American hops running, uh, they usually go towards the citrus and pine resinous profile. Um, and the English hops will go for that kind of old world character, noble hops, grassy, um, and just standard like, you know, soft uh, hoppiness uh, to it. And then of course with American pale ales, we use an American yeast um, and because it's a little bit uh, more neutral, uh, cleaner, and so it's gonna showcase both the, the uh, hops and the malt, and it's not gonna be like a fruity, estery uh, thing that some English pale ales uh, might have. Um, so American pale ales, the appearance, uh, they range from a straw-like pale golden color to a deep amber, so there is a wide range of what you can make your pale ale. So not really confined to really tight parameters. You can pretty much make whatever you want um, and whatever you feel like. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, hop hazy with, uh, when dry hopped, and then it's going to be some uh, white foam with a good uh, hop retention. Um, the aroma, the hops should be moderately uh, uh, strong. Uh, you should get some uh, hoppy citrus notes, but also some tropical fruits, low maltiness, uh, should support the hops, and then um, fruity esters should be moderate to none uh, for this one, and absolutely no diacetyl um, for this, which diacetyl, if you're not familiar with, that's kind of like a buttery uh, feeling on your tongue and also can kind of smell like uh, you know, toffee, buttery popcorn type thing. Uh, the flavor, it's going to be a clean malt character that supports the moderate to high uh, hop flavor. Um, and then once again, citrus flavors, um, malt character can be generous, but once again, uh, it needs to balance uh, towards the flavor of the hops um, on that. And then uh, food pairings is kind of one of my favorite things. Uh, when it comes to pale ales, uh, pizza, uh, anything deep fried, uh, meat fresh off the grill. Uh, New Mexican is also my favorite. I actually had a stint at a New Mexican restaurant in Denver, um, and pale ales go perfectly with a little bit of spice um, on that one. And then a plethora of cheeses, and also when you have cheeses, crackers. So pretty much a pale ale pretty much goes with anything. Um, and that's why it's a really great beer to have um, either on tap or in the bottle in your fridge. Um, you can just pull it out at any point in time. Um, so with that, we kind of went over the uh, uh, style. So the recipe uh, today is going to be, um, uh, I'll just go over it, an original gravity of 1057, trying to shoot for a final gravity of 1012, uh, about 40 IBUs, uh, and uh, about five and a half uh, percent or so. Um, and then I'll let Eric talk about the ingredients. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're using some uh, Skagit Valley malt today. Um, I happen to work with them pretty closely. And so it'll be our Skagit Valley Copeland malt as the base, uh, 10 and a half pounds, I believe we went mm -hmm. with. And then a little bit of red wheat, and a little bit of light Munich, uh, just to kind of round out the flavor profile. Uh, keep it nice and balanced on the malt side of things as well as the hop side of things. Yeah. Um, and then 
You talked about hops, or uh, not not so much with the recipe, right. but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the hops we're going to use today is we're going to do a bittering charge of Horizon. That's a really nice kind of soft bittering uh, hop that goes really well with the American styles. And then uh, basically at the very uh, almost towards the very end of the uh, boil, we're going to hit it with Cascade and Centennial, and then do a bigger dose of Cascade and Centennial right when we turn off the burner. And what does that what does that do adding the hops that late? In the in the boil, yeah, I, so I know that you know you, the longer you boil hops, the more bitterness you get. But mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of late hops. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like you said, the longer the hops are in the boil, the more flavor and uh, aroma are driven off, and you're just kind of left with bitterness. That's why we do a bittering charge at the beginning of the boil because um, we're looking just only for that bitterness. So when we want to have that really big flavor and aroma in our beers, um, late additions are key, especially when you're talking about IPAs. But with a pale ale, even in uh, today's uh, standards, um, hot flavor and aroma is a big deal. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit it with a good charge uh, about 10 minutes left in the boil. That's going to lock in the flavor um, and give it some aroma. Yes, it is going to drive off a little bit of aroma, but we're really locking in that flavor. And then the flame out addition, that's really when we're going to get all that aroma uh, uh, from those hops. So a big cool. charge on Very that cool. one. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, we're going to be dry hopping this one as well because we, we love our hops. It. you got to have some hop aroma that's in that right. beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so right now, uh, just to make sure we're almost there, I'm going to take a look real quick. Excuse me. Let's see where we're at. All right, almost there. So shortly we'll be uh, what we call doughing in and adding the malt uh, to the uh, the mash tun. So just cool. a little bit. Come back over here. It is kind of fun doing a live brew session because uh, you know a lot of the time is just kind of hanging out and just enjoying the day and you know a great brew day. Oh, there's nothing better. <laughs> so we're almost there, um, and I will say I'm originally from Minnesota, and so right now in Minnesota, I believe it's like 90 with about 95% humidity. So being in the Seattle area when it's kind of like 75 and all that is is really nice. All right, so let's see. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start adding the grain. There's only a little bit of uh, water left uh, filtering in uh, from the hot liquor tanks. So we've already gone ahead and uh, milled our grain. And so we have the bucket right here ready to go. And so um, one thing when it comes to all grain brewing, especially uh, when you're using a mash tun, you want to add uh, malt to water, not water to the malt, because the last thing we want is actually dough balls. And so we're going to go ahead and just slowly add this to the water. I usually add about a third of the, uh, the grain at a time and give it a good stir. Now I am actually going to, uh, I'm going for a little bit of a thinner mash. Um, generally speaking, when you mash in, you want about uh, 1.25 uh, quarts of water per pound of grain. And today I'm going about 1.35, 1.4. So I'm going a little bit thinner. Um, I've just found that with this mash tun, um, I, uh, I get a little bit better extraction when I go a little bit thinner versus thicker. So I'm not really looking for that porridge type thing. I'm just looking for a really nice watery porridge, I guess you could say. There we go. And like I said, you don't want any dough balls. And dough balls is basically means that you get a big clump of grain that's wet on the outside and dry on the inside. And that means that you're actually hiding uh, uh, the grains from the, uh, the water so it's not going to get converted from starch to sugar. And so we want to get a full extraction if we can. So it's important. That's why mash paddles also have holes in them so you can kind of drive the, the, uh, the grains through the spoon and it's not just sloshing things everywhere. Uh, yeah, you're kind of mushing it together against the side there. And yeah. Getting there. Very cool. All the grains in there then? Yeah, for the most part. We are going to add a little bit of caramel malt to this, um, but I like to wait and add caramels um, and roasted malts at the end of the mash. Um, Gordon Strong, the uh, 
the aficionado of the BJCP and everything. He's got some really good books out there. He talks about adding uh, caramel malts and, vor uh, and roasted malts at the end for a Vorloff step. Uh, and that uh, basically is so that you don't pull any unwanted things from the grains uh, during the mash. Um, I found personally, uh, that caramels and roasted grains can kind of pull of an, uh, like, kind of like an off flavor or an astringency, uh, essentially. So I like to put those in at the very end. You still get the color, you still get the flavor, um, but generally speaking, you're not usually going to get any sugars from them for the most part. And I just found that when I started doing that method, my beers just started tasting um, a little bit better uh, with that. So. All right, so we're mashing in. We're kind of jumping ahead, but um, I will cover uh, mashing techniques and why we're doing this, but uh, time is of the essence, and so basically I want to get us going as soon as possible uh, for this, so that way it's not a eight-hour brew day, and it's only a nice kind of three-and-a-half to four-hour brew day. So, all right, I think that's pretty much uniformly mixed in. Right there. All right, I'm going to take my temps. Once again, temperature is key when it comes to all grain brewing. And I'm shooting for 153. All right, let me just move it around. One thing when it comes to all grain brewing, uh, when you're in your mash tun, uh, move the probe uh, of your uh, thermometer around because you can get hot, uh, hot pockets uh, in, your, uh, in your mash. And so moving that around uh, really gets the uh, heat uh, spread evenly. And so then you don't have cold and hot places um, around. So I'm just a smidge high, so I'm gonna stir just a little bit more. Um, I've also found that uh, aiming a little high is actually a lot easier than uh, trying to bring up your mash. It's a lot easier just to add a little bit of cold water. And I will say, a cold water goes a long way. So um, if you are gonna add water to your mash uh, to cool it down, just start off with like a small amount and then keep checking because I don't know how many times where I've just like thought I've had enough water, dumped it in, and then I'm like five degrees below my uh, mash temperature. So, and it is harder to get um, your mash up there. It is possible to do it, but it just takes a little bit more work. Um, so let me just check the temperature one more time. Perfect. All right, 153.3. I'm gonna put my thermometer there. I'm gonna lock this in. Now this is a, a, an insulated steel mash tun um, that I really like. It does the job. It is a 20 gallon, so it is a little bit bigger for a five gallon batch, um, but it works, but it also allows me to do a 10 gallon batch or even a big barley wine or something that has a massive grain bill. Uh, so let's see, we're just gonna check in it's 11:45, so uh we got about an hour so 12:45 is when uh the mash will be over i am going to go ahead and get some uh water uh filled up for our um uh to raise the mash um basically uh at the end of the uh of the mash the hour long mash um i am going to want to raise this up to about 168 degrees so i'm going to uh get about i think it is let me just check my beer smith recipe real quick Okay, let's see here, there it is. All right, so I'm gonna do about three gallons and I'm gonna get that to basically almost boiling uh, in here. And that means that when I add the three gallons of boiling water to the mash tun, it's gonna automatically raise my uh, grain bed to right around 168 degrees, which is great for uh, draining into the brew kettle on that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get the kettle filled up um, on there, and uh, yeah, let me just do this. Oh yeah, and then the other thing uh, that we're gonna use today uh, for the recipe I forgot to mention is um, uh, we're gonna use uh, Imperial's flagship yeast, uh, which is their Chico strain, and I just remembered um, is that I forgot to add our water treatment. So um, this water treatment is just really basic, and once again, I'm gonna go over this real quick as well uh, in a little bit, um, but I just wanna get it in the mash ton. So let me just check. So what, what are you adding for water treatment today? So today I'm going to add about a teaspoon of calcium chloride that is going to uh, bring out the malt essentially and then I'm going to add a, uh, a smidgen of gypsum and that's going to bring out the, uh, the hops. It's okay. kind of like salt and pepper for your beer. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I usually, um, well because I teach classes but also um, 
I like to be a savvy homebrewer. I, I like to get the big bag of calcium chloride because this will last me forever. Um, and it's uh, really good stuff. So basically, normally what you want to do, I did kind of forget this step uh, before I added the grain. You do want to add this to the water. Um, it's not a you know disastrous thing if you add it uh, later, um, but you can just do that. And you just sprinkle it in there, and then I'm going to do the gypsum real quick. How do you decide uh, how much to add? That is a good question. Um, that is something actually I'm going to be uh, talking about. Oh my goodness! In a few more minutes. So stay tuned. Dun dun dun. <laughs> yeah, it's a basic uh, water primer um, that this guy in Homebrew Talk, uh, a I think it's AJ Delange. He kind of broke it down in a really good post that's been shared around, and okay. it's just a really good template for uh, easy water treatment. Um, I am also going to add about a teaspoon of lactic acid to try and just you know bring down the pH. I could add acidulated malt to the grain bill, but I like to just do a simple liquid uh, thing of lactic acid. Some people use phosphoric acid. Um, uh, you know, there's mul in, in in brewing. There's multiple ways to do things. Um, I just for some reason I just keep because uh, certain recipes call for acidulated malt, yeah. which is uh, they put lactic uh, bacteria in the malt and kind of let it do its thing. That's why I use lactic acid in the mash. And then if you are, this is like advanced stuff, if you are down the road, want to treat your beer at the, as the end product, phosphoric acid is the one that you want to choose because it doesn't impart a flavor. Okay. Lactic acid gives a little bit of a sour note to it that you can taste. So I've gone ahead and added that, so I'm just going to mix it in into the water. And this should help with the conversion uh, from starches to sugar um, and go from there. Uh, you know, when it comes to water treatment here in Seattle, we have really great water. And so you don't have to do a whole lot. That's why historically there are a lot of uh, breweries here because our water is that good. And it kind of supports hoppier beers um, as well. It smells really good. Yeah, I love green tea. All right, so that's good. Um, all right. So, Locked uh, in? All right, I'm going to go ahead and get the water turned on and get on this one. I'm going to turn the water on for you. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Put the hose at the wall back here? Or? Uh, yeah, um, I'd say go ahead and then uh, I'll uh, yell to you when all I right. need you to turn it off. And one thing I have done on this brew uh, uh, stand that I built myself is actually I put in a nice uh, uh, water uh, filter uh, unit, so that makes things a lot easier um, with that. Close the valve. Once again, always make sure your valves are closed. And I'm just going to go ahead and do about two, let's see, almost three gallons. Um, in this kettle, uh, I have measured uh, that basically uh, when, I or when the valve is open, uh, there's usually about a quarter of a gallon left at the bottom of the uh, thing. So I'm going to do about, um, I need about three gallons. I'll do like three and a quarter gallons. The other thing I will let you guys know is that a really easy tool um, that is not expensive is a, a dowel dipstick. Um, this, you know, if you don't have a sight glass on your uh, boil kettle, um, you know, go to the hardware store, get like a $1.50 uh, wooden dowel, and then put it in and then just fill it up one gallon at a time and make markings on it. And uh, that way you know exactly how much water is in your boil kettle uh, that way. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Hey, Eric, hold on. I actually, uh, I, yeah. See. All right. All right, now you're good to go. There we go. There we go. Sweet. So uh, just to let you know that um, I have uh, a three-tiered uh, brewing system here, um, and I've kind of gone with the vertical uh, version, so I'm using gravity uh, to uh, go from one vessel to the other. 
uh, from there. Um, you can do a horizontal uh, uh, all grain uh, system, um, but that way, uh, if you do go more of a horizontal figure, you do need to utilize pumps. Um, that's why uh, for a simple method of uh, getting brewing um, and not having to get a ton of equipment, I just went with the gravity approach. It's just a little bit easier. Um, if I wanted to, you can always add a pump uh, to this system if I wanted to do like a recirculating mash system or something like that but uh, just to get off the ground and get into a three-tier brewing um, this is just a really easy way to go all right get in there and I will say that um, when you get to all grain water measurements are uh, a, a good thing to have precision over um, you don't want to you know, it's not the end of the world um, if you do too much, but um, that means you might have to boil a little bit longer. Um, all right, Eric. Cool. Perfect. And while things are mashing, I like to kind of get things going so that way, you know, once again, your brew day is nice and efficient. You're not standing around waiting forever, um, and it just makes everything a little bit easier for you. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the burner on. And get that going because I want to get these three gallons to boiling as soon as I can, or not as soon as, but uh, you know, relatively quick within that hour. So I'm not going to crank it up. I'm just going to do a nice even uh, burn on that and then uh, go from there. All right. So let's see here. So we've gone over the style. We've gone over the recipe. Um, we got our uh, this is, um, Strike water for the uh, mash out is going. We have our grain in the mash tun at 153 degrees. That is uh, converting as we speak. And so uh, let's uh, go about uh, uh, building your recipe. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is um, when you're building a recipe, think about the final beer. Uh, what does it look like? Uh, what is it? Uh, what is the mouthfeel and aroma like? Um, is it malty? Is it all hop flavor? Um, you know, is the bittering harsh or soft? Do you want a really good hoppy bite or do you just want a nice mellow bitterness that allows other things to shine through? Um, and then also, will I have a dry finish or a slightly higher gravity so there's a smidgen of uh, malty sweetness? You know, think of a... Uh, uh, like a barley wine. That's going to typically finish off at a higher gravity or higher final gravity. So it's going to be a little bit sweeter versus like a double IPA um, that finishes off nice and dry and makes it a little bit more, se or not sessionable, but a little bit uh, easier to drink um, from there. Um, and then also the other thing to think about is that do you want a nice uh, clean uh, profile of your beer or do you want some yeast character uh, involved in there? Um, so for example, you know, if you're doing an IPA, do you want a classic West Coast clean IPA? or do you want to throw in some yeast character, maybe use an English strain uh, or even you know, use like a Belgian strain and get some really nice uh, esters and phenolics out of those strains and some character from that yeast. So these are all things that I like to think about before I even start building the recipe. What do I want to enjoy in the glass? Um, and so once you have that you know, ideal beer in your head, um, you got to build the malt bill. Um, and then pick a good bittering hop uh, and then go all in on your flavor and aroma. Um, and, and once again, I, I like to think about beer as like, kind of like a house. You want to build your foundation first and then build upon that. Um, and so bittering um, is a really good foundation to build upon. And then you can add uh, uh, certain hops will complement others um, upon that. Uh, pick a yeast that will highlight uh, your ingredients in the recipe but not distract from it. Um, y yeast, White Labs, um, Safale, Imperial, um, they other, uh, and other uh, yeast companies out there have uh, really great detailed information so you can really start to see exactly what you want your beer uh, to be like with its uh, flavor, the attenuation or how much it will ferment um, and uh, from there and also uh, if it's going to drop out so do you want kind of like a, you know think of like a half of Eisen it's very cloudy and that's be, uh, because of the yeast for the most part it does uh, deal with the, the uh, wheats uh, that are in the beers but for the most part the yeast just doesn't drop out and we call that flocculation so do you want your beer to be a little hazy or do you want it to be crystal clear without any use of having to filter or doing anything like that um, and then uh, one thing I will say is that simplicity uh, with your hops and malt uh, can be a, a good thing. Um, having too many ingredients can muddy your beer. Um, 
And so sometimes, you know, a good hop and malt salad can be nice, but choose uh, your ingredients based on your personal preference um, and uh, use a hop or malt guide uh, as a reference. Um, one thing I will say that uh, uh, Yakima Chief Hops has a really good um, uh, hop variety handbook. Uh, it's funny because it's 2016 and this thing is almost outdated because there's so many new hops, but this is a really good reference. And so if you're curious about bitterness or the flavor or anything, uh, this book has a lot of uh, different um, varieties that you can uh, help uh, make your decisions. Um, and so when you're building your wort, uh, basically um, you want to, if you're going to do an extract brew, um, that's basically where you're getting your color, flavor, um, and then you want to figure out how much of the extract you want to put in because um, when it comes to extract, much like all grain brewing, um, you want to calculate for your dead space uh, in your boil kettle. So for example, because this is such a big boil kettle, um, I basically have to calculate for about two gallons of loss. So it's going to be different uh, in a kettle like this versus a small five gallon uh, kettle on your stove top. You're not going to lose as much um, in that kettle uh, as well. So thinking about that and dialing in your equipment um, for your recipe is a key step, especially for extract, because you don't want to think that you're going to be getting like you know uh, a seven percent beer but then you didn't have enough extract and now it's down to like five and a half percent it's going to be a completely different beer at that point um and then with extract you're going to have some steeping grains uh you could do like a partial mash a little bit um but uh, the steeping grains that's going to give you uh your color and uh some added fresh flavor um you're going to get a lot of that from the extract but those steeping grains i think are a key aspect of making better beer um just kind of gets a little bit of that freshness in there and then um, the all grain brewing techniques, uh, we kind of briefly went over brew in a bag. Um, that is a really nice system. I actually went from extract to brew in a bag and I did brew in a bag for about a year and a half. And I think I did like 40 recipes or so in that um, year. And it was a great system. Um, it allowed me to jump from extract to all grain brewing. Um, and I made some really nice beers. Um, I even did a decoction uh, mash with uh, brew in a bag. That was uh, tricky, but we did it. Um, but yeah, it just gets you going. And you know, if you're going from extract to all grain brewing, brewing a bag is a great step because all you need is, if you're on your stove top, then you just need to get a bigger uh, 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 brew kettle and then a propane burner. And if you do do this, you will need to get a wort chiller because you're gonna be dealing with a full volume boil versus like on your stove top, you're gonna be maybe boiling like two and a half, three gallons and then topping up. And that way you can still do like an ice bath um, and without a wort chiller, um, but you won't be able to do an ice bath with like you know five to seven gallons of uh, hot liquid that's almost boiling um, and so yeah so from extract to uh, all grain with brew in a bag this is the setup you'd have a uh, grain bag you fill up your uh, boil kettle here uh, you uh, get your water just like we had here for a strike temperature put the bag in put the lid on maybe wrap it in a blanket I do highly recommend doing that so that way you're not losing any heat um, and then once you're done with the mash, you just lift the bag out and then voila, there is your uh, liquid wort. Um, some people might do a sparge and kind of rinse the grains a little, to get a little bit better, higher efficiency, um, but you can calculate for that. So if you don't want to do a sparge, um, then you know just calculate for like 60 to 65% efficiency of uh, the, um, the, uh, the conversion step um, and then you're good to go. Um, I did both and I liked both results um, off of that. And then basically once you're, uh, if you don't want to do a burn bag, you want to go straight to a three-tiered system, um, you know, the three-tier mesh system uses gravity. I, like I said, I suggest doing um, this one first, unless you want to go all in, which is great. Um, it's you know, it's up to you. It's your personal preference of what you want to do. Um, but you usually get a little bit higher efficiency than brewing a bag, because like once again, uh, you'll be sparging, so you'll be rinsing the grain bed, getting those trap sugars uh, in there. Um, you can do an optional pump system um, from there. Now, I want to talk about sparging real quick because. Um, there are a few ways to do sparging. Basically sparging is, so we have our mash tun, um, we have our uh, water in there, it's steeping in the grains, we have our what's called uh, wort or vort, uh, depending on where you go. Um, and so you can drain it, if you do a batch sparge, that's literally draining the mash tun, getting your wort, and then you have a whole uh, volume of water ready to go at 168 degrees, and then you fill up the mash tun again and then drain it. That's a very easy method to, to do. Um, 
and your efficiencies will be pretty good. Um, you can also do fly sparging, and that is as you drain your mash tun, you'll have water in your uh, liquor tank ready to go, and as it's draining, you're actually pouring water in at the same time, so you're trying to maintain that level so the grain is kind of still sitting there getting a good filtration going on, but um, it's not draining and then filling it up. You have a really nice level that you're maintaining. And technically speaking, a lot of people say that you can get a better efficiency by doing that. Um, I've done both. I like both. I just find that sometimes one can be a little bit more time consuming the other. And then the other way is actually the no sparge method. And this kind of goes back to the brew in a bag. Um, with the no sparge, it basically sounds like it is. You literally don't sparge. You put all your water that you're going to use into your mash tun, drain it, and then you'll have um, a lower efficiency. But the idea is that you actually get the meat of the sugars from the grains, um, and uh, you, you know you'll have a better tasting wort. Um, I've done all three. I've never done a side by side comparison. I probably should. Um, but the idea is. Uh, um, there's a, a method out there called the party guile method, and this is a very old brewing technique where you have a, a you basically brew a really big beer, and you drain the mash tun, and that's your really big beer, and then you'll fill it up again, and then let it sit for a few minutes, and then drain it, and that's going to be a smaller beer. So you go from like, you know, a eight nine percent beer all of a sudden down to like a three and a half to four percent beer, um, and then if you want to do it again, then there's your like table beer that might be like two percent, and that might be something you give to like your kids or something like that um, and this is historically speaking of course but in Belgium they actually have uh, these little taffel beers uh, in school because um, wort is full of nutrients and vitamins and it's really good for you um, with that and the alcohol is negligible at that point um, sometimes if you do a party guile you can actually add a little bit of grain to kind of refresh things get a little bit more sugar in there if you don't want a really big or a really small sessionable beer but the where this goes to is that I found that when I've done party guiles, that second beer is usually just lacking a little bit in overall flavor and quality. And um, so that kind of led me to believe that the no sparge method, you're kind of getting the best parts of the grain and then leaving everything behind and sacrificing uh, efficiency for quality, in my opinion. Um, like I said, I need to go back and forth. I need to do a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison. But um, the beers I have done with the no sparge uh, have been pretty darn good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and crank this up a little bit. One thing I will say is adding a, a built-in thermometer to your uh, brew kettle and your hot liquor tank makes things a lot easier. That way I don't have to go up and like take an actual reading over, you know, really hot water and steam and all that kind of stuff. It just makes it really nice and easy to go. And then also adding valves to your brew kettles is really nice. Um, you can either buy a brew kettle that has it like this one, it's already built in, or you can just get a cheaper variety and then get like a weldless uh, uh, valve and thermometer. And that's what I did on this one. This is actually uh, my original boil kettle um, here. And then I bought this one, so then this went to my liquor tank. But that, this allows me to do, this whole setup here allows me to do a 10 gallon batch, if not a 15 gallon batch, depending on the grain bill size and how much alcohol I want to get. Um, but it's nice because I can still do a five gallon batch uh, whenever I want. Um, so that kind of covers building the wort. Um, Let's see. One thing I always like to talk about is that when you go to all grain brewing, it is more control and variety compared to extract. Um, you get, of course, your sugars, flavor, and color, but base malts, that's the key aspect to um, all grain brewing. You're going to get a lot of flavor uh, from your base malt, so it's not just for your sugar. Um, you can really play around with your beer style uh, just by choosing different base malts, and there's a ton out there. Skag uh, this recipe, once again, is from Skagit Valley. They have great uh, malt in my personal opinion, and they're kind of leading the, uh, the uh, revolution of the new malting uh, era that we're in, which is really exciting. Um, but you know, uh, there's plenty of other, there's Vireman and Best Malls and Great Western, which is an American uh, variety, uh, Gambrinius from Canada and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, like I said, it's just, it's not just for sugar. So, you know, to each is their own, but you know, you don't have to uh, cheap out and get the cheapest base malt you can actually go a little bit more, spend a little bit more, and you will get a better beer, in my personal opinion. Um, and then uh, when it comes to specialty grains, so uh, specialty grains are going to be your caramels, your biscuits, 
um, you know, flaked oats, all these different kinds of things um, that you can use. Um, and with those, you can do a traditional mashing where you throw everything in here. And we kind of covered this a little bit. You throw everything in there, you do your mash, you draw it out, and then voila, there's your wart. Or you can do Vorloff grists. And, um, and there's two ways to do this. You can do the Vorloff grist, which once again is going to be your caramel or crystal malts, and then some of your roasted malts. So think of like your chocolate, roasted barley, um, uh, you know, brown malts, uh, and all that kind of stuff that's going to give it a really dark color and dark flavor. Um, wait till, you know, add those at the end and you might actually get a, a smoother uh, flavor. Uh, I actually did this for the first time. Um, about a year and a half ago uh, with my dry Irish stout. Um, my dad was coming and he loves uh, Guinness and so I always like to have a, a keg of that for him when he comes over. And so the first time I made that recipe, I just threw everything in there. It was good. It wasn't uh, close to um, you know Guinness or anything like that, but it was good. And then I started reading about doing these Vorloff steps and immediately when I did that, um, the beer was really nice and smooth. You had that roasted flavor, but you didn't have that overall bitterness that can kind of be distracting um, from the other ingredients. And when I did that, I was like, wow, this actually has some merit. So I've been starting to do that uh, with all my recipes, and I do that with the caramels as well. Um, and I just found that it just makes the beer a little bit better, um, if not a lot better. So I'll leave it up to you guys, but um, in my personal opinion, uh, doing a Vorloff grist has just made my beer that much better. So it looks like our broadcast is down. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I'm going to have a sip of beer. Oh. Okay. Are we, we're back. Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> we're so back. All right. So uh, sorry for the technical difficulties on that one. I think we, we just had to cut for, uh, for Jesse to have some beer. You know, you, That's can't, right. you can't show beer on TV. Yeah. <laughs> so what, do you, what are you drinking there, Jesse? Um, I am drinking uh, your smoked porter, <laughs> and it is very good. Well, I, I like hearing that. Yeah, yeah that, that beer was kind of an experiment. Um, so I, I get to work a lot with Skagibelli Malt, and they provide malt for a lot of the home brews that I do. So I was able to get some of their maple smoked Ooh, Copeland, yeah, and it's like the smoothest smoky that you'll ever get, and it's yeah. like breakfast malt. Um, so I brewed this pretty awesome uh, little porter with it, and threw some oak in there to kind of round it out, and it seemed like the perfect beer for an 80 degree day. You know, I gotta <laughs> tell you, like it's hot out, but it's not that hot out, and this is already like at temp, you know, yeah. but it still drinks really smooth and it's really nice and quenching at good. the same time. Good. I'm glad. Um, so thank you. So I think we're going to cut away to a, a pre-prepared package really quick. Awesome. Um, so Hop Stories does videos for the for the beer industry um, and I'm not sure which video Brandon's going to show here but there's a lot of cool there's a lot of cool videos out there. Um, so Bear we're cut, cut away to this uh, video about Bear Island Brewery. They're a veteran-owned brewery in Boise, Idaho. Um, so I hope the people watching enjoy, and we might have weird glitches, but we're going to figure stuff out. So That's right. Stay right. tuned. It, it's in a house. You know, you can't, you can't show you're running a business once you close the doors. It needs to look like a house. It needs to look residential. It can't look commercial. You can't have stuff out there. You can't have stowage. It's, it's got to look like a residence. Bear Island is my dream. I was a beer connoisseur uh, when I was in the US Navy. I got to travel all over the country and the world trying all different kinds of beers. Uh, it just spurred this desire inside of me to learn more about local flavor. And then came home to visit and looked in the grocery store and there was no local beer on the shelf. There was no local beer on tap anywhere and I was going, well, this is dumb. Why not? So I said, well, that's it, I'm starting a brewery. When I finish my Navy contract, I'm going home starting a brewery in Boise, Idaho. One of my favorite things is waking up in the morning and smelling some of the, the hops, the cinnamon that, that filters through the house. Like nobody else can get that, it's awesome. Uh, the good part of it is it's right here. I don't have to deal with traffic. I just come to, come to work, start going. The struggle is you need to get out and you need to meet people and see people and converse with people and interact with them and that's, it can be difficult when you're running 14 and 18 hour days. Events are uh, they're a love-hate relationship. Setting them up, hate it. Once everything's porn's good and the beer's flowing, one of my favorite things in the world to do. I get out, I actually get to talk to the people. I get to get out of the garage, talk to the people that are consuming the beer, 
tell them about it. Give them the passion. Tell them the story that they, you know, they may not hear, they may not find somewhere else. It's a, it's a huge avenue. It gets people excited. So when we do get a tap room and we do grow, uh, we've already kind of established the brand and the loyalty and everything. So it kind of, everything just kind of falls into place a lot easier. That way. So one of the things that makes Fair Island very unique is uh, we like to use indigenous ingredients. Uh, not that other breweries don't, but we make it a focus. Uh, especially being small, it, it affords us the opportunity to make the weird batches and have fun and explore. So uh, one of our fun weird ones that we did was we decided we wanted to do an imperial stout. Well, everybody does an imperial stout and bourbon barrel age and all this, and they're great. But we said, well, what if we use some kind of unique ingredient? Well, there was a time I had a lavender chocolate bar and I thought it was the best thing ever. So I started searching and I found a local lavender farm called Red Chair and uh, created a relationship with them. And so now we have Lady M, our imperial lavender chocolate stout. Our flagship, the one I'm holding in my hand actually, is Idaho potato ale. Yes, there's actual Idaho potatoes in it. It's just, it's really fun to use local ingredients. We've used local honey. Uh, I just picked some pumpkins the other day for our imperial Belgian pumpkin ale, you know? And so we, we just like to explore to have more collaboration in our community. Uh, and that's something that makes us very, very unique. We are, we are not, now we're back. Now we're back. All right. <laughs> we're back. We're trying to figure this out. This is yeah. the first time we've ever done something like this. Um, so we're here with Jesse from Abrosis Brewing, or Brews, yeah. homebrew instructor, assistant brewer at Flying Bike, oh, yeah, and sure. uh, we're brewing a pale ale today. So Jesse, tell us where we're at um, and where we're going next. All right. So uh, if you're uh, joining us for the first time uh, now in this live feed, basically what we've done is I've heated up water, added grain to our mash tun, and we're uh, sitting uh, basically about 153 degrees. Um, and uh, once uh, at 1245, that's when the mash is going to be done, the end of the 60 minute uh, mash. We're then going to drain into our boil kettle, and I have some uh, uh, strike water uh, heating up to about boiling, about three gallons. So that way when I add that to the mash tun, it's going to rise the uh, grain bed temperature to about 165 to 168. I'm hoping to get to 168, but if I don't get there, it's not a horrible thing. Um, from then, I'll be able to release, have the sugars released from the grains into the wort and uh, start filling up the kettle, and then I'll uh, get my, uh, uh, my uh, uh, sparge water going um, as well, and that way I can rinse the grains uh, and get my total boil volume, which is gonna be about nine and a half gallons, because we're gonna be boiling for about an hour, adding hops at the beginning and then at the very end. And so uh, we'll start about nine and a half because I have the Blickman Hellfire Burner, uh, which is awesome. It does a great job, especially for um, larger brews. Um, this is gonna boil off about a gallon and a half of wort per hour um, from there. And then I'm gonna leave about two gallons of wort at the bottom uh, due to trub and all the kind of proteins from the grains and everything. And so that way I get about five and a half gallons into my fermenter and then when it goes into my keg, I should uh, lose about a half a gallon or so. Um, and that way I get five gallons at the end of everything, which is what we're looking to get from there. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about now is um, we've kind of gone over the basics of uh, building your recipe, trying to get the beer that you wanna have. Um, but uh, I do wanna talk about, since we're doing an all grain brew, about why we're doing things the way we're doing it. Um, so basically, uh, when it comes to mashing, we're looking for specific things and temperature can be key. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to, uh, the hot liquor and strike water, um, that is basically a precise temperature. Uh, you want to heat your water before adding the grain. It's just basic thermodynamics. The temperature of your grain is here. You want to have the uh, water here, so that way when you add the hot water to the grain, say it's at 75 degrees, that way it automatically uh, gets your uh, mash at 153 degrees or whatever your mash temperature is going to be. Really easy. You don't have to do a whole lot of stuff. It's just an easy calculation. If you have brewing software like Beersmith or Brewer's Friend, you can actually uh, just plug in your temperatures and your volumes and it will calculate that water for you automatically. So for example, today when I mashed in, um, I just had about five gallons of water in there. Five gallons, I heated up to 168 degrees and it got me right where I needed to be um, based on that. Um, yeah, uh, let's see here. And I talked about uh, dough balls and hot pockets, uh, not the kind that uh, uh, 
you know, well, well, we won't even go that way. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> so uh, once again, you want to rake your mash, uh, make sure it's a uh, uniform temperature um, done appropriately. You should v come very close to your target temperature of mash conversion. And your mash conversion is usually going to be between 145 and 158 degrees for most uh, beer styles. Um, once you reach your mash uh, temperature target uh, temperature, it is best to maintain that temperature as steady as possible um, for the next 30 to 60 minutes um, while the complex sugars in the grain are converted to simple ones. Um, you can also wrap the mash tun in towels to kind of help insulate a little bit. Um, this one is kind of uh, insulated already, so I don't usually have to worry about it. But if you're going to be doing brewing a bag, I highly, highly recommend getting a big old blanket and wrapping your... Um, your uh, boil kettle slash mash tun because you will lose heat. Right now, even though it's like 75 degrees, 80 degrees, you'll still lose heat because you're going to be sitting right around 150 degrees. And so you'll lose some. And I will say this, if you are going to be doing this uh, in the winter, which is a great time here, yeah, it doesn't get as cold as it does in Minnesota, but still 30 degrees, you will leach a lot of heat from your uh, boil kettle mash tun when using brew in a bag. So, or even if you have a cooler mash tun, just that added layer uh, will give some protection to that temperature. And like I said, when it comes to all grain brewing, temperature is key. So um, I'm going to borrow a little bit um, from uh, Brad Smith of Beer Smith. He has a really good little thing about uh, mash temperatures and why we do things to get the specific sugars. Um, and so basically, uh, he says, uh, great beer balances bitterness, color, flavor, and body. As an all-grain brewer, you need to understand how to control the body of your homebrewed beer using mash temperature. By altering your mash schedule to match the style of beer you are brewing, you can achieve precise control over the body and mouthfeel of your beer. The key step in the mashing is called the conversion step. Frequently done at temperatures between 150, or 146 and 156, 158, depending, uh, the conversion step breaks down complex sugars in the grains into shorter chains of sugar that will be consumed by the yeast. Uh, the two main enzymes active during the mash are going to be your alpha and beta amylase. Alpha amylase, uh, which is the most active in the 154 to 167 degree range, uh, creates longer chain sugars that are less fermentable, resulting in a beer with more body. Beta amylase, which is the most active between 130 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit, once again Fahrenheit, uh, trims off single maltose sugar units that are more fermentable. The result is a more complete fermentation or higher attenuation and a cleaner beer with a thinner body. Um, and basically what that means is, uh, let's just say yeast only eats uh, four molecules of a sugar chain. When the yeast eats the, uh, the, the four molecules of a sugar chain, if you have a longer chain of sugars, it's going to leave, say, uh, you know, if you do the higher uh, temperature, um, uh, it will give you, say, 10 sugar molecules on that chain. Yeast is only going to eat four. That, way, that means you're going to have six left over. And that means basically you're going to have a higher final gravity. It's going to be uh, uh, more body, more residual uh, sweetness. Now, if you mash in lower and say you have five molecules on that sugar chain, yeast is going to eat four, and you'll still only have one left, but it's going to be a lot thinner. Um, I will say that yeast doesn't eat 100% of the sugars uh, uh, that you're going to be having, so you will always have residual sugar left in your beer um, for the most part, um, but by utilizing precise uh, control over your uh, mash temperature, you can control whether it's going to be thinner or more body and higher sweetness or drier beer um, just by utilizing the right kind of temperatures for your mash. Um, yeah, so uh, real quick, I d you know, we kind of briefly went over calcium chloride and gypsum and water treatments and all that kind of stuff. But basically, um, uh, uh, you know, easy water treatment is, is uh, really easy. Um, and so, uh, you know, for most beers, uh, you'll add about a teaspoon of calcium chloride for every five gallons of water treated. And then you can add about 2% of sour malt or acidulated malt uh, to the grist to kind of help with the pH. Or you can do what I did and actually add um, uh, liquid uh, acid in the form of lactic acid or phosphoric. Um, for softer beers like a Pils or Hellas or some lagers, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you ha use half of that amount, half the calcium chloride, but then increase the sour malts or the amount to about 3%. Um, for beers that use roasted malts, like your stouts and porters and even brown ales, you actually want to skip the acid because you will get acid 
in uh, from the darker grains. Now that is if you actually put those in the mash tun. If you're not putting those in the mash tun and doing a Vorloff step, you still want to use um, some acid uh, to help with the pH. Um, and then for British beers, like your British IPAs and pale ales and all that kind of stuff, um, adding one teaspoon of gypsum as well as the calcium chloride is a good idea too. Um, and then for very minerally beers, like an export or a Burton ale, double the calcium chloride and the gypsum. And so, um, you know, one thing that I like to do is, you know, thinking about calcium chloride and gypsum as salt and pepper for your beer. Uh, calcium chloride brings out the malt, gypsum brings out the, be uh, the hops. And so if you've been brewing like an IPA or a pale ale that you're really looking to get those uh, hops shining through and they've kind of just been meh, uh, and you haven't done this already, try adding, you know, like a half teaspoon to a teaspoon of gypsum uh, and seeing where things go. And uh, I, when I started doing that as a home brewer, my hops really went pop. Um, and then uh, if you're looking for the more maltier version of beers, um, just a little bit of calcium chloride can help. And the really cool thing is that you don't necessarily have to add that in at the mash. You can add that um, uh, at the very end. You could literally add that, those things, uh, the calcium chloride and the gypsum to a finished beer. Um, and if you do that, just pour, you know, like a four ounce sample and take a little bit, mix some uh, in the water and then add a little bit here and there. And you'll be able to actually dose your final beer and really have uh, that precise control. I'm just going to go ahead and check our temperature real quick. Oh, perfect. We're already at boiling. So I'm going to dial this down a smidge just to kind of keep it warm, keep it where it needs to be. Um, but I don't want to boil off too much because let's just see where we're at. Well, we got about 20 minutes uh, left in the mash uh, uh, today. Um, so yeah, uh, we're getting there. We're right on track, which is great. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about are hops. Um, so hops uh, basically come in pellet or leaf for the most part uh, when you go get them at your local homebrew store uh, from there. Um, hops bal balance the sweetness of the malt. <clears throat> There are a multitude of flavors and aromatic oils and hops. Uh, we haven't even scratched the surface on what uh, is even in those uh, things. Uh, modern studies right now are going uh, through trying to figure out exactly what is in hops, but it's a whole new frontier and we're just starting to get into it. <sighs> All right, um, and then the other thing with hops is that there, um, over there are hundreds of varieties out there, and each of them has a unique flavor and aroma um, from all over the world. You can get hops from uh, over the mountains in Yakima. Most of the hops uh, in, in a lot of the beers uh, around the world come from Yakima. Um, you can get hops from New Zealand and Australia. Uh, those are kind of uh, called uh, Southern Hemisphere hops. You can get hops, uh, Germany, uh, you know, the uh, Czech Republic, uh, Britain, and all that kind of stuff. Um, a fun thing now that people are doing, especially um, in Germany, they're kind of taking American varieties and growing them in Germany and getting some really awesome uh, flavor profiles that you wouldn't normally get uh, from there. And that's due to the terroir um, of the growing region. And so you can get different things out of uh, the same hops just by growing them in different areas, which is a, a really fun thing to do. Um, and so to go over the basics of uh, utilizing hops in a brew, um, you know, you want to go, you, you have your bittering, your flavor, and, and your aroma. Um, bittering is usually, uh, you know, 60 to 90 minutes at the beginning of the boil. Um, and uh, like we talked about before, the longer hops are in a boiling wort, the more aroma and flavor are driven off. And so really you're just looking for the bittering aspect. Most traditional styles of beer uh, call for a bittering charge at the beginning of the boil. We're starting to get into um, a new uh, realm of brewing where people are actually forgoing the bittering addition and just going straight into flavor and aroma and picking up all their IBUs that way. Um, and so, you know, your bittering charges for your IBUs coming from the alpha acids, you get the isomeritization of the alpha acids into uh, in, uh, IBUs, which is the international bittering unit. Um, and that's how we can kind of uh, measure the bitterness of the beer. So, you know, think of like 25 IBUs, 30 IBUs, 60 IBUs, and then like for the huge IPAs, 100 plus um, <clears throat> going from there. And then flavor, that's going to be kind of the last, uh, you know, 15 to 10 minutes left of the boil, like for this uh, 
recipe, for example, we're throwing in our Cascade and Centennial at 10 minutes left in the boil, so we've boiled for already about 15 minutes or so. You can do uh, flavor uh, additions earlier than that too. Um, some call for like a 30 minute addition or even a 20 minute addition. Um, it just depends on the recipe and what you feel like as a brewer yourself. Um, and then the aroma is gonna be the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes of the boil, usually actually at the end of the boil, which, which is what we call uh, flame out. You can even do an aroma addition uh, in the Whirlpool or do a hop stand. And that is basically you um, turn off the boil uh, and the burner, you add your hops and then you chill down uh, to lower than 180 degrees, uh, between 180 and 170, let's just say. And what that does is that below those temperatures, you don't pick up IBUs, but you get to infuse all of that great flavor and aroma into your beer. So if you're looking for this huge IPA or even a pale ale that you want a huge dose of aroma, um, doing a hop stand or a whirlpool hops um, will greatly intensify uh, those um, aspects of the beer. So like the new hazy IPAs, the juices and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the hop uh, flavor and all that comes from those Whirlpool and hop stand uh, additions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off for right now uh, from there. Let's see. All right, so once again, to kind of go over the hops, um, hop varieties that are uh, often used are American types, um, but it is worth experimenting with hops uh, from Europe, New Zealand, and Australia and see what might suit your taste. You might have this recipe that you've been brewing forever, and it's really great, but you know, if you swap out a hop from, say, New Zealand or um, you know, a German variety that has an American uh, hop growing there, it might actually transform your beer into something that's really you know, better um, or just different, you know, and people might like it or something like that. But it's kind of fun to experiment. That's what we do as homebrewers, just kind of experimenting with everything. And then uh, the other thing is uh, thinking about IBUs and bittering. Uh, bitterness, of course, ba balances the sweetness of the malt, but some hops give more than others. Um, IBUs doesn't always mean a strong bitterness. And basically, um, there's a thing in hops called cohumulin. The lower the cohumulin, the softer the hops are, and that can actually allow other things in the beer to shine through. Um, and so, and then uh, beers uh, or hops with high cohumulin have that kind of like uh, sharp uh, bite to that. So think of your classic C hops. Those are usually higher in cohumulin. Humulin. So if you want that flavor profile from those hops, choose the high cohumulin. But you know, if you have a friend or a significant other or people that just don't like hoppy, bitter beers, um, I actually kind of did this with my sister-in-law. I brew she didn't like IPAs, and uh, I brewed a 80 IBU IPA with all soft, low cohumulin hops and gave it to her, and she was shocked at how much she liked the beer. Um, she's like, wow, what are these flavors I'm getting? It's fruity and juicy and citrusy and all these things. And I told her it was an IPA and her jaw hit the floor and she couldn't believe that it was an 80 IBU IPA. Um, and that's because she just did not like that harsh uh, bitterness. Um, but she did actually like the flavor of hops. So something to think about uh, down the road when you're coming up with your next recipe. So I think we're going to take another little break here. Perfect. Um, so we're gonna be showing another video, Brandon. What do we what do we got coming up next here? Beer trends. Beer trends. Um, so we went to a, a beer conference and interviewed some brewers and asked them what the next trends are in the brewing industry, and here are their answers. So enjoy. Um, we're gonna take a break, get some water, etc. Yeah. Next big trend in beer. The next big trend in beer, I think, is gonna be. I'm gonna say sessionable beers so you can drink them all day. We're on the beach, you gotta be able to day drink. I would say the return of Pilsners and Lagers. Lighter beers, not so much just sessions, but traditional style, lower ABV, more drinkable beers. Hazier IPAs. Everyone's getting really big into sours now. I still haven't gotten onto that trend yet. It's up to the consumer, I guess. If I knew that, I'd be doing it already. I'm gonna have to say something like a Goza or some sour like a kettle sour. Weird yeast. Flavors. Super local for one, but I think people are going to go back to more approachable beer styles. I would love to say lagers. I feel like a safer answer is session beers. Good beer in the long run, I think, is what's going to be judged, and that's a return to classic styles. Uh, Pilsers. I think we're already starting to see it happen. We're going down the lager road. Um, I hope it's going back to beer flavored beer. I see the alcohol, the ABV, going down a lot, and a lot of more people are starting to turn on to lagers. It seems like lagers are getting big, hazy beers are big, so I'm thinking, you know, uh, hazy, 
overly hopped Keller beers. They're just gonna be riding the kettle sour. It's not gonna be Goza's anymore, but it's gonna be Berlin or Vice's. More balanced session beers like Irish Reds, English Browns, just a good beer that's like just pleasant and gentle on your palate. <laughs> So we are back. Um, hope you guys enjoyed seeing some beer trends. Uh, that was that was fun to fun to interview all those guys and gals and kind of hear what's what's coming up next in the industry. Um, so Jesse, where are we at in the brew, and what do we got uh, coming next? All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and start draining off the mash tun. Um, our uh, uh, strike water is getting up there, so uh, I'm gonna actually go ahead and just get that going. Open up the valve. And uh, when you do this, uh, basically I have uh, boiling water ready to go to add. And so when I add this straight to, there we go, get my little uh, thing going right there. So I'm going to go ahead and open up and start stirring in uh, the water to kind of get my uh, grain bread um, raised to trying to get to 168. If we don't get there, that's okay. There's actually been some uh, newer studies that say you don't have to get to 168. Once again, when it comes to brewing, it's all personal preference. Um, you can kind of do what works for you best, but um, I always feel a little bit better when I get to uh, 168 or close to there. Um, plus, uh, you know, when you get up to that uh, temperature, um, you don't have to wait as long when you're trying to get to boiling uh, when you run off your wort. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and add all of this to here. With this mash tun, it's kind of nice because it's got a port so I can run directly into here. Um, sometimes I can actually just take the hose off and put it in there and go from there. So I'm gonna let that drain a little bit. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, once that's done, uh, getting the three gallons of boiling uh, water into the mash tun, getting our temperature up, I'm gonna go ahead and drain um, <clears throat> with the silicon tubing uh, into my trusty pitcher. Um, this is a great little pitcher, and what I do is I typically have found that if I drain about a gallon of uh, wort from the uh, mash tun, um, I get most of the grain bits uh, coming out. Um, and that way, uh, this is kind of the Vorloff step. And so Vorloff is literally mean recirculating. And so I'm trying to get clear wort going into the brew kettle. I don't want to have um, uh, grain bits floating around. That can cause some astringency, some graininess, uh, leaching some tannins and stuff like that. Tannins are great in wine, but we really don't want them that much in beer. Um, so we're going to go from there. And then you know what? I just realized that uh, we need to do a step with our uh, grains. We still need to add our caramel because we're coming up on Vorloff. So you know what? We have an awesome uh, demo to show you of grinding grain. You know, we, we like to keep our, uh, our viewers riveted, so, you know, watch this. So basically we have some really great caramel 15 uh, from Skagit Valley. Uh, right here, and I'm gonna just weigh out. We're only gonna do about eight ounces or so. Um, I'm gonna weigh it out, and then we have this awesome barley crusher. It's a great malt mill. I will say, if you're an all grain brewer, um, getting your own malt mill is a great investment, um, and it's nice to kind of have things uh, ready to go. Uh, grain itself, you can get away with grinding your grain a few weeks. Um, a week or two ahead of time. Um, but like anything else, fresh is always better in my opinion. And so literally you're gonna get <clears throat> the freshest flavor coming out of your grains if you crack right before uh, you know you mash in and stuff like that. So we're gonna go ahead and just pour that in. And then uh, the nice thing about this guy right here is that you can just hand crank it, or if you have a drill, you can actually hook up your drill uh, to this and kind of get it. But uh, getting a nice little exercise today um, with your barley crusher is not always a bad thing. And eight ounces doesn't take that long, which is great. Um, if you haven't had a chance to try Skagit Valley malts, um, I highly, highly recommend them. I've been recommending them since uh, I started trying their malts almost three years ago now, I think. Um, and I just think that their, the overall quality of their stuff is just great. And I usually get a higher uh, extraction out of them too because they have a low protein uh, content in most of their grains. So that means less stuff at the bottom of your kettle and more stuff into your fermenter 
and then ultimately into your glass. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add that grain straight here, give it a stir, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna infuse that great uh, light caramel uh, sweetness into that, get the color that we want for pale ale, um, but none of the uh, harsh attributes that some uh, uh, roasted malts, because uh, you know caramel is roasted, it's caramelized sugar, um, and so sometimes you can pull off a few unwanted things, in my opinion. But uh, once again, we'll leave it up to you to make your own opinions on this stuff. That's the beauty of home brewing. You can do it in multiple ways and do what works for you. So I'm gonna take a temp. Oh, great. We're already to 166 degrees. So we're getting there. This is great. This is a good brew day. Um, like I said, if you don't get to 168, it's not like the beer is ruined or anything like that, but I always just feel a little bit better when we're at that point. There we go. <clears throat> All right. There is that, so I'm going to put that back down. And I'm just gonna, I like to let this rest at 168 degrees for about, you know, five, 10 minutes or so. Um, and that just kind of allows everything to get to temperature evenly. Um, no, uh, you know, stratification of temperature or anything like that. Um, now, the other thing that I need to do is, let's see, we need three gallons of sparge water. So, um, if I could ask Eric to go ahead and turn on the line for us. Oh, we'll go That'd turn be... on your water. Awesome. So once again, nice filtered water going into the hot liquor tank. This just takes out, you know, it's a, this thing's not like a, you know, super high expensive filter, but it does the trick. It gets a lot of the impurities out um, and it just kind of makes the water, you know, uh, what it should be. Um, it's just an added step. Um, you don't necessarily have to do this, but um, I just like the idea of it. Get my uh, trusty dipstick. One thing I will say is that if you can, and if you have this situation, I am a tall guy, but I still like to have a little step stool because I can fill this thing up and kind of tippy toe, but then I'm dealing with hot water and a hot, uh, uh, you know, boil kettle. And uh, I don't like to really touch this too much because it is scorching hot. So getting a step stool just makes things a lot easier. Um, and then you don't have to worry about that hospital trip uh, because you burned yourself or toppled a whole kettle of boiling water on you. All right, Eric. Thank you. All right. Boom. So I might not have said this before, but um, you know, when you're going, uh, you know, moving from extract or just getting into brewing in general, um, you can utilize. Think, you know, remember, you can utilize your old equipment as you go. So as you build up, um, you know, like I said, this this was actually my first big batch uh, boil kettle. It's a, you know, 14 and a half, 15 gallon boil kettle. My first one was an eight gallon kettle that I got and that was when I was on my stove top because that gave me enough headroom when things were uh, getting dicey for the uh, boil. Uh, the hot break happens, I didn't want to have a boil over so you want that good amount of headroom. Um, and so when I went to the three tier system, when I first built this, um, that eight gallon boil kettle was actually my hot liquor tank and I bought this guy and that was my boil kettle. <clears throat> and then when I upgraded to this guy, I just utilized my uh, 15 gallon boil kettle is my hot liquor tank. And that allowed me other things. I still have that eight gallon boil kettle I do use from time to time. Um, if I do a party guile, um, I actually uh, have another burner at home. I'll actually, we'll use that because all I need to do is get me to about, you know, six and a half gallons on that boil kettle. Um, so I can draw off into this guy and then draw off and then I have my little guy uh, boiling as well for my small beer. 
So being conscientious of, uh, you know, what you might think of growing to as a home brewer um, can kind of help you uh, in the uh, bank account region. Um, but also if you want to go all in, that's cool too. Um, but like I said, there's little ways that you can kind of keep things uh, from uh, escalating price-wise. But this is a hobby that, you know, if you've been brewing or want to get brewing, you can easily catch the bug and uh, it's now a lifetime hobby. And that's the best part about it. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, get this, trying to get this up to about 168 degrees because this is our sparge water. And so um, while that's going, I'm going to now uh, start the Vorloff because um, our, uh, our wart, our grain bed is kind of set for a few minutes now, so I feel pretty comfortable uh, going in uh, here. So let's just take our temperature just to make sure where we're at. Perfect. Fantastic. All right. And so uh, one thing I like to do is um, when you do uh, mashing and all those things, uh, getting a silicone tubing is really nice because it is uh, heat resistant. Uh, it is insulating a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour off about a gallon and then pour it back on top. Um, so I like to go full open, setting the grain bed. And I'm pulling off a ton of grain bits. I'm actually going to show this to the camera in a second. So I like to go full open and then dial it back so it's a nice uh, slow stream because you don't want to drain too fast. You can actually uh, leave more sugars in the mash uh, than you want. So dialing back and getting a nice flow. And I found that with this system, uh, doing a gallon usually gets me to the point of a nice clear wart. You can do two gallons, you can do more if you want to recirculate more and more, you can, but I've just found for simplicity uh, and time, uh, one gallon is uh, works really well for me. Um, it might take a little bit of time, but I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but um, maybe uh, when this is done I'll show you there's a bunch of grain bits floating around and husks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you don't want that boiling in your beer. You're going to get some off flavors uh, from that stuff. So, um, A fun fact, uh, anthropologically speaking, um, for a very, very long time, people actually only uh, mashed their beers and drove it off. <clears throat> they actually didn't boil it. Um, they would take uh, hot stones and heat them up and put it into the uh, mash and then they'd lauder the mash tun, which means drain, and then that's it. They wouldn't boil. They'd probably have um, some flowers or herbs maybe in the mash tun, uh, you know, because it is going to be hot um, but not boiling. And so they get their bitterness and flavor and aroma from uh, various herbs and flowers, sometimes hops. Uh, hops do go back a long time. We're finding more and more... Uh, uh, reason that people used hops a lot longer than we originally thought, but for the most part, um, uh, for you know tens of thousands of years, in my personal opinion, um, uh, you know they didn't boil their beers; they just mashed. And I actually did a no-boil brew once. Um, it was different; it had a more grainy taste, um, but uh, it was really good. I will say though, um, it got better with age, um, and so I kept it around for about a year and a half. And it was really, really good. Um, one of the guys at the homebrew store that I used to work at, Micro Homebrew, he actually hated the batch of beer right when I first uh, made it. And then I kind of tricked him uh, a year and a half later, didn't tell him what the beer was. And uh, he tried it and he's like, man, this is a really good beer. And it actually was the no boil brew. Um, and uh, I got him to admit that he liked it. So that was kind of a fun thing. So uh, Bob, this one's for you. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, start filling up uh, the uh, boil kettle and as you can see it's just a really slow stream uh, coming in filling up from the bottom um, and it's nice and clear and that's what we like to see and so we're just going to slowly let this uh, go in I'm going to put the top back on the mash tun because we don't want to lose all that heat so we're just going to slowly fill up the boil kettle uh, from the bottom up uh, and make it easy and then uh, here is um, the wart if we want to take a look at this do some nice close up. You can see it's full of stuff. It's full of grain bits and protein and all these different things. And we don't want all that stuff in the beer um, or in the wart boiling. So I'm going to go ahead and just put this back in the mash tun and recirculate. Um, I will say, uh, you know, this stuff is going to taste really good. I do recommend tasting uh, the wart as it's coming out of the mash tun because, for one, it's super delicious and it kind of gives you an idea what your overall beer is going to taste like as well. 
Um, so I'm just going to slowly add this. There's various ways to add this uh, back to your wart. You can have a splasher or maybe a plate or something like that in there um, so that it just doesn't uh, go all in one area because you don't want to have channels developing into your grain bed, um, which means that it's going to be not filtering through the grain. It's just going to channel and go faster so you will not have as much um, uh, extraction on that one. The other thing I'm going to do is as this is filling up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the burner because I want to get this boiling uh, as fast as I can and not lose any of this precious heat. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Hopefully I don't. There we go. Perfect. And I'm not going to go full out. I'm just going to go nice because I don't, you know, there's only a little bit in there. But this is going to help uh, get things going to where I need them to be. Oh, let's see. I was going to say something, but I forgot what I was going to say. But that's all right. Okay. Oh, that's right. So uh, the other thing that I like to do is at this time, um, when it comes to olive grain brewing, knowing your gravity is, is a good idea. Um, ultimately, it's good to know your pre-boil gravity. Uh, <clears throat> and then, um, you know, obviously your final gravity. But I like to take gravities as we go just to kind of see where we are, see how extraction is going. Because this can actually play a, uh, an important role in the overall uh, beer that you're making. Because, you know, right now I think we're uh, trying to get about 65% efficiency. You'll never get 100%. Um, you know, there are some breweries out there in the commercial world that are, you know, uh, saying that they get 90 to 95 percent. That's extremely high, and they actually have special equipment to do that. For most brewers, um, you'll range between 60 and 80 percent if you're lucky. Um, so right now we're set at 65 percent, and so um, I'm just going to test the gravity. This is a refractometer, which is kind of a great little tool. Um, and it, basically you just need a little bit, it, you uh, look at the light, it refracts and it tells you what your gravity is. Um, if you're using a hydrometer, you do have to wait for, oh, uh, you do have to wait wait for it to cool down and that can take a long time and so when it comes to all grain brewing a refractometer is a great little tool now with that being said um, you well you can but you, you don't use a refractometer once fermentation has started um, because the presence of alcohol will actually strew your readings and you have to equate for that and it's kind of a pain so I do uh, still use a hydrometer um, when the beer is fermenting but uh, at this point a refractometer is a great little tool and so our first runnings are at uh, 1054, so that's pretty, pretty good. It's getting there. Um, it's probably going to be getting a lot more as well as we fill up. So, all right. So, how are we looking on our temperature here? <clears throat> Oh, perfect. All right, so we're coming along. Once again, this is a you know a, a process that you want to give it some time, get good extraction, um, and uh, you know just let let the beer do do its thing um, on that. You don't want to rush. You can rush, but then uh, you just don't get the extraction that you're looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. It smells really good. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, at this point, it's kind of fun. I, I do take a, a page out of. Uh, uh, another um, uh, thing that was online a few years ago, and uh, Michael Dawson talked about the hot scotchy, which he got from, I believe, uh, Ray Daniels' book. And basically, you take the fresh wort, put it in a coffee mug, and add a shot of whiskey or scotch to it, and it's pretty darn good. So, do you need Do you need some whiskey? I can go. Uh, oh no, I'm I'm just saying. <laughs> this is something you can do. You know, at this time of year, it's kind of hot, but I'll say, uh, you know, when it's like 30 degrees, or if you're in Minnesota, and it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's negative negative 30. Um, that little bit of warmth helps you out. Maybe make make a little like icy, like a bunch of crust, crushed ice. Oh, throw some of this yeah, there, a little uh, wort slushy. Yeah. Ooh, that would be good. That would be good. Um, Idea for next time, I guess. Yeah. But I always suggest you know taste your wort. It, it it's really good. Um, for me, it you know I, it it just kind of harkens back to um, you know the old times. You know, in, in human history, uh, wort was. Uh, you know, the reason why we have beer for the most part um, 
there's something to be said when you taste that flavor of the wort, it just goes straight into your bones. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, there, there's something familiar about it and it just tastes good. Plus, uh, just by doing this, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, it's sat right around 160, so it's essentially pasteurized for the most part. It's coming in, uh, it, the water is safe to drink. Um, there's, you know, no harmful bacteria in there. The wort is sugary and sweet, and uh, we're good to go. All right, um, so as this is going, I just quickly wanted to go back to building our recipe real quick. Um, and yeast, that's the, one of the main important uh, factors in brewing your beer. Uh, and talking about yeast selection, so once the recipe has been built, the next task you'll have is actually uh, the biggest impact of the final beer. Um, and that is going to be your yeast strain choice. Uh, home brewers have a wide selection of uh, different ale strains to choose from. And the strain should be chosen based on the style of beer, the fermentation temperature, original gravity, and then also the time available for conditioning or aging your beer. Um, so the question is clean yeast or estuary yeast? Uh, do you want a lot of flavor um, from your yeast? So English and Belgian yeast can impart um, some great flavors to help beef up your IPAs or pale ales or anything uh, else. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, um, so with those yeasts out there, you have uh, dry yeast. There is less variety when it comes to dry yeast. And then of course, uh, liquid yeast. Now one thing I do want to dispel is for a long time people considered dry yeast to have a huge uh, cell count um, in their packs. Well, that is actually false. A lot of people thought they had about 200 billion, and most of the time it's usually between 75 and 100 billion. Um, so it's not quite the huge pitch that we thought it was uh, back in the day. So keep that in mind uh, when you're getting your yeast. You actually might need to get two packs or more depending on your uh, beer uh, that you're going to be brewing. And then when it comes to liquid yeast, a lot of them, Y yeast and White Labs are at about 100 billion. Imperial yeast, which is the new yeast company uh, out of Portland, they they tote uh, 200 billion uh, yeast cells when it comes to that. And so um, thinking about that, having the right pitch. <clears throat> Now, when you're about to pitch your yeast, you do want to cool your wort down to 65 degrees, if not uh, uh, 75 degrees, if not 65 degrees, um, because you don't want to kind of hurt the yeast or stress them out before they even have a chance to get going. Um, and then uh, I like to pitch the yeast if it's dry on top of the wort, let it sit for like five to 10 minutes, splash it in. Um, and then I do like to use uh, pure oxygen uh, when I uh, uh, pitch my yeast or right before, because they need a good amount of oxygen for a healthy fermentation. You can also splash it back and forth you can go bucket to bucket and all that kind of stuff. But getting oxygen into your wort and getting some splashing in there is highly uh, viable to your yeast. Um, and then of course there is the lag phase or if my Minnesotan accent comes back, the lag phase. Um, and basically it can take up to 48 hours uh, for your yeast to start fermenting your beer. Um, and if you have a pitch rate that's higher, uh, th there is a faster lag time. Um, and so you can actually, uh, to get that, you can do a yeast starter. So I kind of have a thing right here with a stir plate um, and uh, a graduated flask right here. Um, granted, it is water, but you can kind of see that when you have a stir plate, <clears throat> It's drawing in the vortex, and so you're actually getting a little bit of oxygen coming into your uh, your yeast uh, starter, um, making a little bit better. You don't necessarily have to do a stir plate. Um, you can just put it on your countertop, and just every time you look at it, pick it up and slosh it around, and that will be really good um, from there. So, yeah. All right, so I think we're going to cut away to another uh, package. Um, so we were at GABF this past year and we interviewed some brewers to hear how they're giving back to their local communities and oh, that's something yeah. that's really cool about the <laughs> that's something that's really cool about the industry is how people uh, are willing to give back awesome um, so if we can go there we do fundraising charity events pretty much every week part of the reason that we started the brewery is to get involved in the community and be a community um, centric location. And I think it starts with uh, supporting local businesses. So our kitchen purchases um, a lot of their produce, a lot of their meat from local Ohio farms. Bingo is the one thing we've been doing recently, charity bingo. We just did a program called Hops for Harvey. We donated kegs to a, um, a day where every single beer that was sold that day went straight to Hurricane Relief. We raised $30,000 for Hurricane Harvey Relief and um, we had a really great party for the home brewer, so. We do benefits like for uh, firefighters, first responder kind of people, we've done some of that stuff. We actually build uh, hops for homes, and we get to build homes for people that wouldn't usually have a home, so. We generally just give people good beer. That's giving back to the community, in my, <laughs> my mind.
All right, man, this is this is coming along nicely. So yeah. are we going to be pretty close to the boil by the time we're topped off? Yeah, for the most part, as, as it's uh, because I have the burner going and as it slowly warms up, I mean, this thing is already, you know, close to boiling, so yeah. it shaves off like, you know, 30 minutes usually. Very cool, very that, cool. So, yeah. All right, well, we'll we're back from uh, from that. I hope you guys enjoyed that little video. Um, that's just kind of a sampling. Like, we love going to conferences and festivals and stuff like that. And yeah. just talking with brewers and hearing hearing feedback from them and hearing kind of about them. So, um, anyway, we're transferring, right? What 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 what's going on right now? Fill fill people in that haven't been watching. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if this, you know if you're just tuning in, basically uh, we have soaked our grains in hot water and we have some really great grain tea or wort as we call it and that's pre-beer essentially before it's fermented and so we've added hot water we're draining that uh, into our boil kettle here we're already right around five gallons we're trying to get to uh, nine and a half gallons uh, pre-boil volume and so right now we're actually heating up our sparge water we're going to Sparge water is used to rinse the grains, um, and we're doing a batch sparge. So that means we're draining the mash tun, and then we're going to fill it back up again, let it sit for a few minutes, and then drain it again, and then we'll have our pre-boil volume. And the nice thing is that to kind of cut time, and this is a really good technique if you haven't done it as a homebrew already, is as you're filling and draining your mash tun, turn the burner on and get that thing going, and that way uh, you're heating up the wort close to boiling and so you're shaving off about 20 to 30 minutes of uh, your total brew day because you're not sitting there waiting for it to heat back up from say 150 degrees. Um, and so we're pretty close. Make sure that's still on. Perfect. So I'm going to turn that off and by the time we're ready to put that in, uh, we should be good to go. I'm just going to check things, see where the level's at. We're actually pretty close to that. So. Let's prop this up a, a smidge. Oops. Oh, I won't worry about that too much. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just open up the valve slowly. Get in there. I'm going to close this. So because I'm I am doing a batch sparge, I am going to do a Vorloff step because um, if I was doing a fly sparge, I'd be maintaining that level of the water. Um, but because I'm batch sparging um, and I'm going to stir up the grain again, um, I am going to want to do a Vorloff so we don't get uh, more grain bits into our uh, boil kettle. So I'm going to close this off, and then this is going to be uh, draining into our mash tun. And going from there, and then we should be able to uh, be boiling pretty soon. There we go. So this is smelling pretty darn good. Um, I think this is going to be really nice. Um, one thing that you can do with the leftover grains, are called spent grains, is actually um, you can dry them out and make uh, a spent grain bread. Or uh, if you've ever gone down to Deschutes. Um, they actually have a really good spent grain pretzel that is to die for. Also, uh, a lot of animals um, love spent grain. Uh, if I have a, a dog, a little Boston Terrier, and when I give her this, this is like the treat of the day um, for sure um, with that. So right now, uh, slowly filling up. I'm just making sure that uh, the grain is uniformly getting uh, soaked by the water. And once again, uh, you don't want any uh, thermal zones um, in your mash tun. There we go. Okay. All right, so while that's going, uh, we are actually going to do the first uh, hop addition. And this is actually, so instead of doing a hop addition right when it's ready to boil, I'm actually going to do something called a first wort hop. And what this is, that we're actually adding uh, hops to the wort before it's about to boil. Uh, and the theory is, is because you're adding it before it's boiling, you're kind of locking in that flavor um, to this. The other thing that it's a good uh, bonus on this as well is that um, by adding hops before it starts boiling, you can actually try and prevent boil overs because hot boils are very um, uh, they will kind of ignite the wort into foaming up on you they're very volatile and so by doing a first wort you can kind of counteract that uh, process from happening so what we're gonna do is that and I believe let's see it's gonna be just a small uh, charge of uh, 
you know, 0.65 ounces, so just over half an ounce of Horizon. Um, Horizon, just to kind of give you an idea of what Horizon hops are, I'm going to go to my trusty little book here. Um, that I do always recommend people get, especially if you're a brewer and you want to get into it. So Horizon is considered a dual purpose hop. You can use it for both bittering, flavor, and aroma. Um, and it's low cohemolin, so it's going to be softer. It's not going to have that bitey edge to it. Because we are using Cascade and, and, uh, Cascade and Centennial at the end, those are high cohemolin hops. So I'm trying to kind of balance everything out because we're doing such a big charge at the end. So I wanted a nice low cohemolin, soft bittering charge, um, and that will allow the hops and the malt to shine through um, on this one. The aroma profile is floral, bouquet, sometimes spicy. It's perfect for both ales and lagers. So this is a great bittering hop for multiple multiple styles of beer and that's why I actually got a big pound of it because I use this a lot and I'm going to be able to use this in many more uh, beers down the road. Um, and then uh, I will say uh, get yourself a really good digital scale or a scale in general because um, that way you can do an accurate uh, measurement um, of your hops and you're not kind of eyeballing it because at this point um, you know, accuracy with hops, uh, you know, is, is an important thing. It, you can, uh, if you're off a little bit, your IBUs will be uh, out of sorts and your, your beer is just not going to be what you want it to be. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, get this set up. And always make sure to zero out the scale and all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and pour these out and 0.65 ounces. So I did a little bit extra, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that back. Perfect, 0.65. Um, at this point, um, some people can choose to actually use a hop bag um, or hop spider, so that way the hops are contained. But honestly, I found that um, you know with this setup, it's just easy enough to just go ahead and just pour it straight into here. and. Uh, the one thing that uh, I always notice that when I add hops is you always get that huge charge of aroma coming through and obviously since we're going to be boiling all that aroma is going to be driven off. So what do you think about this Eric? Oh man. You getting some nice uh, aromatic smells from this Horizon? That is surprisingly good. I've not, I've never used Horizon. Oh really? Um, so I didn't really know what to expect. When I saw the recipe I was like, oh Horizon, oh okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so usually I use just like Columbus or something like that for my first. Yeah, and uh, Columbus is a, you know, that's a great bittering hop. Um, it's, you know, you know, the hop for most IPAs, especially West Coast IPAs. Yeah. And even your hazy, juicy New England styles, mm -hmm. um, they will use Columbus. Um, but uh, I used to work at a homebrew shop here in Kenmore called Micro Homebrew, and I worked there for a while, and basically I was able to really get a good idea of all the different ingredients and play around with the different hops. Yeah. And I just found, you know, with a pale ale, we're not in IPA land. Right. We want a nice, easy drinker that a lot of people can drink. Yeah, definitely. Um, Horizon Magnum is another one, mm -hmm. um, which is mm -hmm. a good one. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's funny, I haven't used uh, uh, this in a while because I've been doing some other uh, different batches, but I could, with this aroma, I could actually see this in like, you know, like a good German lager or something like that yeah, too. Yeah, um, definitely. Or even like a blonde ale. It's just, it's got a nice, kind of like a sweet, you know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing going on. It's, it's, yeah, definitely. It's nice. All right, so I'm going to check the mash real quick because we are still doing that. So I think the water is almost done. So I'm going to stir it up, get everything back into suspension. I'm going to have to reset the grain uh, bed again because, you know, the whole idea is so if you're not familiar with mash tuns, I probably should have talked about this earlier. So you see this big old apparatus right here. Um, there's actually something called a false bottom. And so there's a screen, uh, a, 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 a round screen at the bottom that provides an empty space, a dead space at the bottom. And so what that does is that the grain just sits right on top of that, uh, that screen and it allows uh, the grain to stay above it and get only clean wort coming through. And so when I start Vorloffing, it's actually kind of setting those grains uh, in a, a good pattern so it filters the wort uh, at the same time. So um, yeah, because I'm stirring it in. Uh, right now, getting it all back up into suspension, and then it will sit, and I'll do my Vorloff step right now. Let's see, put this right back here. There you are. All right, so once again, I'm going to open up full and really get all those grain bits. There they are. 
it's going to be cloudy again, and then I'm going to dial it back. Get a little, there we go. Letting it go really nice and slow, allowing that grain bed to set and that wort to come out really nice and clear. And once again, at the same time, I have this burner going on, um, heating up the existing wart that I already drew off. And so uh, it's, uh, it's doing a good job, it's getting there. Um, yeah. And like I said before, if you weren't watching then, um, I like to Vorloff. About a gallon with this system uh, works really, really well. Um, it gets to the point in time where it's pretty much, you know, uh, clear. Um, there's no grain bits coming out, um, and uh, the grain bed and everything has done its job. So I don't have to recirculate or Vorloff too many times. Others uh, have different opinions, and that's great. That's the whole thing about home brewing. You can do things your way. Um, it's what you like, um, and if you like the beer coming out, then keep on doing what you're doing. Um, but I will say, you know, keep an open mind and try some things from time to time, and uh, you might be surprised. You can get the same result doing less than doing a lot more and spending a lot more time. Um, I myself have a two year, uh, almost two year old daughter, so time is of the essence. And so if I can shorten my brew day, uh, that makes things a lot easier uh, for everybody. Um, she does like to kind of come out and brew with me. She likes to kind of stir the, uh, the grains milled into the bucket and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, nap time is a great time to brew, that's for sure. All right, so we've already got the one gallon. I'm gonna go ahead and put that on open up the valve and just let that start filling up. And as you can see, uh, there is actually a kind of a boil already started, so that's fine. Um, once this starts uh, filling up even more, it will die down that boil. Um, but, you know, we don't have to wait that long in order to get to a boil. So I'm gonna go ahead and Vorloff and recirculate this wart back into the mash tun. You can do it slow, you can do it long, just depends. Once again, I try not to do it all in one spot. I don't want to develop channeling. There we go. All right, so that's done. And then just like at the brewery over at Flying Bike that I work at, um, setting yourself up down the road and kind of getting yourself cleaned up as you go is always a really good efficient thing and that way you're not tripping over hoses and all that kind of stuff, so. All right. So at this point, I am actually gonna go ahead and put the lid, well, yeah, I'll put the lid on just a little bit there and kind of keep it heated smidge as it's filling up. We'll check it from time to time. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so we're pretty much done with the hot liquor tank at this point. Um, the mash will be done and then all of our focus will be on the boil kettle. And we'll, uh, this is, is gonna be a 60 minute or an hour long boil uh, today. Uh, so nothing too long. Um, uh, some people like to have a 90 minute or an hour and a half long boil. Uh, sometimes that can be from uh, the use of Pilsner malts that can kind of have a higher uh, collection of um, uh, products that can give you uh, higher levels of DMS, uh, which can create like corn-like vegetal uh, flavors in your beer. Um, I've done both an hour and an hour and a half boil with Pilsner malts. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, some people can pick it up, some people can't. Um, but what do we have here? So this is a uh, wheat, uh, wheat ale, lime wheat. Um, yeah. Skagit Valley white wheat, with a little bit of Copeland Bay malt, and then four zested limes for a five gallon batch. So wow, comes through a little bit. Yeah, um, I'd say so. Uh, yeah. Nice refreshing Cheers. beer for for standing in the in a hot sunny day. Ooh, that is nice. Crystal hops. Um, oh, crystal. Yeah. Nice. Um, I actually just got some uh, crystal. I haven't never used it before, so I was curious to see. Yeah, yeah. So it's just really late addition, and that's that's about it. It's oh, wow. pretty simple. Yeah. No bittering charge or anything? Or? Uh, like a quarter ounce of Columbus. Just oh, just to a give smidge. It something. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I wish you guys could be tasting this because this is like <laughs> perfect for today. And this this actually killed the keg too. I went and filled the oh, growler. Oh, these are the lucky out. glasses. Yeah, 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 for sure. So in a second here, we're gonna cut away to another package because um, we're hungry. Pizza that we ordered has arrived, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, so this next one, I think it's Speciation Brewing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Comstock Park, Michigan. Um, and they're a sour brewery that Ooh. they do some really cool stuff. Um, my favorite uh, beer from them that they're doing right now is a, a series of beers around the Great Lakes where they, where they actually brew it on the lake shore, ferment it out there overnight, or uh, just kind of yeah. uh, let it set. And then wow. whatever yeast settles in the beer, they, they use. and. So that sounds it's delicious. pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So if you're ever in Michigan, check them out. Yeah. And the, the regular Michigan, not Upper Peninsula. Regular right? Michigan. Yeah. 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 Nice. Nice. All right. But yeah, this is yeah, this, this is, is good. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, this is like perfect. Yeah. Um, at Flying Bike, we have like tons of crystal hops that someone gave us. Like, I think we have like eighty pounds. I guess the whole process is pretty magical to me, but. Uh, fermentation always blows my mind, still like still to this day. I, you can tell now because I started a brewery that basically is only about fermentation, not really focusing on anything else. So we started off as we were just going to make session beer, basically. We were going to make low alcohol, crushable, drinkable beer. The more I did the business plans, I rewrote and rewrote business plans, and I was like, you cannot make a profitable brewery with such a tiny little product. <laughs> it, it would be fine for other people if you have the startup capital, but we just didn't. Every time I rewrote the business plan, basically, I would take out little sections uh, just to make it more affordable or to make more sense with the, the business plan. First thing that went out was uh, the tap room. So we, we just decided we're gonna be a production brewery to start. We're just gonna focus on making beer. We dropped a brew house after that because it just saves so much money uh, on, the, on the front and also kind of, it saves a little bit of time too. And so everything just came together in a sour brewery. We get we're in. I pitch my, my house cultures, which is just um, three strains of Brett, a couple strains of lactobacillus, and then I also cultured a couple yeasts out in Holland, Michigan, um, by the lakeshore from uh, my parents' crab apple tree. I started with that initial batch, and that has fed every beer that I've made since then. So it's whatever, whatever yeast has come out of there, yeast and uh, bacteria, feeds the next one. It drifts. The, the flagship beer is Genetic Drift, and we picked that name to kind of help people wrap their minds around the fact that the microbes are gonna shift from batch to batch based on what thrives in each given batch. With our business model, um, we don't have any debt and we don't have any investors, so I'm completely free to do whatever I want, so I can experiment with um, things that most investors would probably frown upon. For example, it allows me to not really have a concrete plan of what I'm going to release month to month. I have, a, I have a loose plan, but it kind of is determined by what beer is ready when. With this kind of beer, sometimes it'll be done in two to three months. Sometimes uh, there, are, there are batches that just take much longer. So second Saturday of every month, we do a bottle release. And so far, every batch is sold out. Um, so I think it's definitely working out. Yep. All right. So um, we're still chewing on some pizza. That was um, quite a bit to chew, but <clears throat> um, so we had a request from Jason to talk about the recipe a little bit again. Mm -hmm. um, so malt-wise, well, so we're doing a pale ale today, right? right. Uh, malt-wise, mm -hmm. we kind of wanted to stick with something that was Pacific Northwest. And what's more Pacific Northwest than? Skagit Valley Malt. They're up. Yeah. They're up just an hour north of Seattle. So top two percent soil in the world. There we go. It's just a awesome place to grow malt. So we're doing a Copeland, ten and ten pounds, ten and a half pounds. Ten and a half pounds. Of yeah. the Copeland Pale. Uh, we have some red wheat. We have some light Munich. 
A mm -hmm. little bit of C15. Yeah, a uh, pound and a half of light Munich so that the color is not too uh, dark. Uh, and then a pound of uh, red wheat and then just a nice little eight ounce charge of uh, Crystal 15. Nothing too sweet or caramely, just a nice little note in there. Yeah, and that really kind of helps make a nice base for yeah. some of these pale, for some of these hops to, mm -hmm. to complement in the pale ale. Yeah, because you know, in American pale ale, you, you know, for the most part, especially here on the West Coast, it, it's, you know, it's a little about hop forward, so mm -hmm. you want the malt bill to, you know, be the foundation for the ha to hops, you know, to kind of like dance around and, yeah. you know, and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Definitely. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, and then, uh, where are we at in the process so that people that might have just be tuning in can kind of yeah. check it out and catch <clears throat> up? Yeah, so basically we've, uh, here comes the here comes the garbage recycling truck, truck. there it is. Uh, <laughs> so basically we've uh, heated up water, uh, soaked the grains in our mash tun here. We've already uh, drained out the first portion. We're now draining out the second portion, trying to get to about nine and a half uh, gallons, excuse me. And it looks like we're about eight, uh, about eight gallons uh, in already. We've added our first wort hops. Uh, and so to, instead of a traditional bittering charge at the beginning of the boil, we added our bittering charge as it's filling up uh, with the wort uh, not quite to boiling yet, trying to lock in a little bit of that flavor. Uh, we're using Horizon, uh, 0.65 ounces of Horizon. It's a nice low cohumulant soft bittering hop to really allow the Cascade and Centennial to shine through. Um, so we're getting there. Um, I'm going to take a gravity reading uh, pretty soon. Uh, to make sure we're at our pre-boiled gravity. I aim for about 65% efficiency, um, and that means obviously we're gonna be leaving uh, some sugar in the grain bed still. If we wanted to, if we wanted to make this an eight hour brew day or something like that, um, we could do a partigal where we'd have hot water ready to go, fill out the mash tun again, let it sit. We could even add a little bit more Copeland malt uh, to get a little bit more sugars and then get another beer out of this one. It'd be a smaller beer, um, something very small, maybe three percenter um, with that, but that's a lot of work, a lot of time, and this is our first episode here, so uh, we wanted to treat you to a nice simple brew day uh, today. Um, so yeah, so things are going really good. The horizon is smelling really nice. Obviously that's gonna be driven off from the boil, uh, but we're going up um, and we are like just hovering at 210 degrees. So <clears throat> I'm not even gonna worry about putting the lid on. I will say that um, putting the lid on bef to get to boil is actually a really good thing. It will help uh, with the heat loss um, and everything. Um, but the one thing you want to do is not leave your lid on while it's boiling. Um, we talked uh, briefly about DMS, uh, dimethyl sulfide, and that's something that can kind of give you like a... Um, you know, basically like a cream corn, canned corn, vegetal uh, flavor in your beer. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, what happens is that during the boil, uh, the, the boiling process actually drives that off uh, through the steam. And so if you have your lid on your kettle, it's trapping that, dripping it back into your brew and you're not getting rid of it and then you will notice it in the final beer. Um, it's not something that is uh, very pleasant um, in my personal opinion. Um, if you love cream corn, then go at it and enjoy your can of corn beer. Um, you could make it if you wanted to. Um, so we're getting there pretty close. Um, I'm just going to check the mash tun real quick. I'm going to put this back on here. Bloop. All right, we're getting there. So this is doing pretty good. Um, since we're towards the end, I am just going to go ahead and just open up the valve. For the most part, during the first part of the uh, of draining the mash tun, you want to go nice and slow. But now we're at the tail end. I kind of want to get things going, and so I'm just going to open up the valve. Um, and get her uh, going, try to get us to that pre-boil volume. Um, I will say, you know, if you are, uh, if your calculations on water were not exact, and let's say, you know, we're at nine gallons instead of nine and a half gallons, well, that's okay, you could top up right now. Um, granted, if you add cold water to boiling, you're gonna have to wait that much longer. But honestly, um, <clears throat> You could just top up at the uh, end of the boil when you get into your fermenter uh, because for the most part, your calculations are correct in the amount of grain and what your original gravity wants to be and how much sugar is in there. Um, so by topping up at the end, you're not actually you know, doing anything. Uh, you're not doing a disservice to the beer itself. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so we're just kind of letting that thing, let, letting it uh, do its thing here. We're already just about to nine gallons, so we're well within our way. And then we have basically 50 minutes 
of uh, watching uh, wart boil. So stay tuned because it's riveting. But we're going to have some fun stuff for you today. Uh, we're going to probably uh, uh, hop back to some hop stories. Uh, see what I did right there? Uh, we're going to do that uh, again a few times. Uh, I am going to talk uh, briefly about the uh, anthropology of beer um, and kind of give you an idea of why we drink beer and why it's important to our culture uh, today uh, with in many cultures, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and also why we're able to actually ingest alcohol and not die from it for the most part um, so yeah uh, that's gonna be some fun stuff um, let me just check to see where things are at perfect <coughs> excuse me um, yeah so one thing uh, I will say about uh, your typical brew day is uh, you know you can do a quick brew and try to be under the gun versus time, but you know what? Um, I found that the more enjoyable the brew day, the better the beer ultimately is. Um, you know, the brew, you know, when you're when we're brewing, it's a hobby, it's something we'd like to do, so why make it a stressful situation? Just enjoy your day and have a good time. Today is a beautiful day. Um, there's only a few clouds in the sky. We can't see it right now, uh, but I'm sure the mountain is out, so if you're not if you're not uh, familiar with that term here in Seattle, whenever we can see Mount Rainier, we always say the mountain's out today. Um, I'm lucky enough, I live actually down in Kent, so I'm a little bit closer to Mount Rainier. And uh, man, when that thing is out, it is impeccable. Um, so we're really lucky to be here in the Pacific Northwest. We have uh, the mountains, we have the sound, all that good stuff. Um, and the temperature right now is perfect. I'm really happy we're in this carport right now, so I'm not in the blistering sun. Um, I will say being, uh, we are a little bit higher north than some people might be, and so in the summer, especially at this time, the sun is a little bit more intense. And so it can be 70 degrees, but it can kind of feel like 80, so being in the shade is uh, a nice thing. Um, I myself actually have a, a covered deck um, at home, so I don't have to worry about things too much, but uh, yeah. Um, but I think we're getting pretty close. Um, just a few, a little bit more time. Uh, I will say that I really enjoy the pot that I have here because it has the graduated markings on the inside. They're etched in so I don't have to use a dipstick. Now with this one, it doesn't have that. And then once again, if you haven't uh, <clears throat> been watching earlier, a uh, really good investment for $1.50 is a simple wooden dowel. Put it in your boil pot and just fill it up a gallon at a time and then just mark it with a Sharpie. Um, and uh, it gives you a great tool to know exactly what is in your brew kettle and get the measurements right. Uh, with this one, it already has it. Um, you could also get like a sight glass if you wanted to, but you're gonna have to make the etchings on that as well, unless you, of course, you get like a Blickman brew kettle or something like that. Um, but I think we're pretty close. Pretty close yeah. um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close off the valve down here and put that right there. Where is my thing? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this and then I'm just gonna fill in a little bit more. Potentially, there's actually a few grain bits in here. Wow, this is like perfect. I'm, I got like maybe a cup. So I was thinking about throwing this in there, just, you know, just why not? But honestly, we're at our pre-boil volume. Um, and I really don't need to add this in there, so this is actually just gonna, um, I like to kind of just, you know, uh, dump it and, you know, say thank you, and we're good to go. So, uh, yeah, we are rolling. And the nice thing is, is that we are very close to boiling. Um, we're at like 290 degrees, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get this thing cranked. I wanna get a nice rolling boil, um, a soft simmer. You know, uh, there's you know a lot of schools of thought out there with the boil type. Um, you can do a nice soft simmer, you can do a nice rolling boil, it's kind of up to you. Um, with this situation, I just like to have a nice rolling boil. Um, like I said, with the Hellfire burner, I can boil off about a gallon and a half per hour. <clears throat> and so that's why my pre-boil volume is nine and a half gallons, because um, basically, uh, you know, I'm gonna be, uh, you know, getting right around, what, eight gallons or so. And so when I lose about two gallons of wort, I should be right around, you know, six to five and a half gallons of wort into my uh, boil kettle um, from there. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is we're at our pre-boil volume and I'm gonna go ahead and take a gravity reading. So once again, if you weren't uh, with us before, um, I have right here a refractometer, and this is actually something that not only brewers use, but also uh, 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 
wineries and the vineyards will use. Um, other people will just, you know, so if you're in the, uh, in the vineyard, you kind of want to know what the potential uh, sugar is going to be in your grape. You'll just take a grape and spring it on there, throw it down, and then look, and then you'll know basically what it is. Same thing with uh, brewing. We're going to take our pre-boil uh, volume of wort here, which is nine and a half gallons, and we're just going to take a little bit. All you need is just a little bit, a little splash, and that's all you need. Um, with most refractometers, uh, the, the temperature will already kind of uh, uh, help you. Uh, it will already kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Uh, cool. It was there and then went. Um, it calibrated. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so we'll already kind of calibrate for the, uh, the temperature that it is because obviously we're at boiling. Um, I do personally like to keep it about you know, 30 seconds, let it kind of do its thing. Um, I have found that if I try to take a reading right away and then I go back and look about a minute later, it has changed. So I do like to kind of give it a little bit of time. Um, and so we just find a good light source. Natural light is always better when it comes to refractometers, but inside light works as well. But I usually get a better reading. Um, let's see, let me look. Let's see here. There it is. All right, I'm going to say 1048. So let me look at my recipe here. Oh, that's actually good. So according to Beersmith, um, <clears throat> I needed, uh, I was supposed to be at 1046. So we actually got a little bit higher uh, than we were expecting. So I would say we're probably more like 67% efficiency um, for the most part. But uh, yeah, so that's good. That's not a big jump. So it's not anything to be, uh, you know, uh, scared of or anything like that. We don't need to really adjust our hops. Uh, in bitterness levels, things should be well balanced. And uh, Now, if we were 10 points above, say we're at 10.58, that's a different game. We might want to think about adding a little bit more bittering hops because our alcohol is going to be a little bit higher, so we want a little bit more balance. And so that's why when it comes to all grain brewing, knowing your gravity is on the onset can change uh, you know, how you uh, go about um, brewing your beer. Um, also, the lower the gravity, the more uh, hop utilization you'll have. So actually, if I was 10 points lower, my IBUs would actually be higher. So thinking about that is another uh, idea as well. Um, and just being aware, if we, you know, you can use a hydrometer and everything, but once again, you have to wait for it to get down about 68 degrees to take a reading. So you're waiting. I can actually do this, you know, right now and figure out everything. Um, so this is uh, uh, starting to go pretty well. Um, almost to boiling here. I saw it kind of doing a nice simmer <clears throat> from there. And so one thing that I'm doing right now in Beersmith, and that's kind of why I have it here, you can also have it on your phone or your laptop or anything like that. Um, and I just like to make sure to put down what my readings are so that way I don't have to rem remember. Um, and now I have it so the next time if I brew um, and I do this recipe again, I can look back at my notes and really figure out what I'm doing. Yeah, and we're actually going to have that recipe available online. Great. Awesome. Uh, so people that are watching this can hop up there, and uh, I think you can actually find it right now at uh, hopsters.com slash livebrewtv. And there's a link right there, um, and it'll get you right to the recipe that we're brewing today. Awesome. So. Great. All right, Brandon, do we have uh, another package that we can... Uh, yeah, sure. We got on? weird beer. Weird beer. Weird so, beer. Uh, this is Brewers talking about uh, the weirdest beers that they've ever drank. So that could be interesting. Uh, I know there was some chatter earlier about Hot Pocket beers. So um, <laughs> Hot Pocket. That would be a weird beer, that's for sure. Yes. All right. Man, that's a tough one. <sighs> wow. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Weirdest beer, it's called Mestivus Fest. It's sweet and piney and literally just tastes like Christmas in a glass. I uh, had a uh, soured porter last night that was pretty weird. It was interesting. I went back for more and I'm done now. I had a raspberry peppermint spearmint imperial stout. It was about 12% and it was just too much stuff. It was like a stout with, with curry spices. Uh, there's this terrible beer made with hot dog water. Uh, Sweetwater's pork beer, the one that has like the barbecue flavored thingy going on. 
Mangalist, a pig from, uh, I think it's Right Brain, brews it. Uh, they actually use pork products in the beer itself. So I'm going to go for Wood Drip, which is made with 100% maple sap as opposed to water. So no water is in the beer. All right. All right. All right. So we are back with we are back with live brewing on Hop Story's Facebook page, and uh, we're here with Jesse, and he is showing us how to brew a pale ale today, which is, you know, it's one of my favorite styles, just because it's it's it has some of the same characteristics as an IPA. You know, I want like a hoppy beer, mm -hmm. um, but it has lower alcohol, so you can drink a few of them. Yeah, it's and, sessionable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you're still you're still doing all right. Um, so where, where are we at right now, and what's coming up next? So uh, basically we're uh, pretty much to a boil. It's just uh, it's creeping up. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to go ahead and just, just open it? this up. Go hellfire mode, oh which goodness. is what Blickman talks about with this burner. Um, this thing throws out a ton of BTUs, and so you can get from uh, not boiling to boiling pretty quickly. Um, you do need to be careful um, to kind of uh, back her down once you get to a boil because this thing can actually come up pretty fast. Oh, yeah. Um, if you have never had a boil over, um, you're lucky. Uh, boil overs are not fun. It gets everything sticky. And the old adage is true. A watched pot never boils, but an unwatched pot always boils over. That's a good thing to think about. Um, and so, uh, and, and the reason it, it, it uh, boils up is everything, just like think of like, you know, when you're making macaroni or pasta or something like that, it's all those starches and sugars kind of coming up and all the proteins, and it starts coagulating coming up. And so um, what we're looking for is to get a really good rolling boil. We're getting a little bit of hot break right here. Um, what which is, is good. What is hot break? Uh, hot or hot break is um, all the proteins and uh, you know grain bits uh, coming up, um, and then after a little bit, it'll just kind of go back into the beer and go away. Sweet. So, yeah. Turn off. So I'm gonna go ahead and back this down. Now we're up to a boil. So let's start our one hour. So it's like perfect. We're at 1:30. So awesome. 2:30 we'll be done with the boil. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna back her down. Because <clears throat> um, in my, you know, like I said before, my personal opinion, I like to have a good rolling boil. Um, uh, you can do a simmer and everything like that, but I don't want anything that's like too combustible. We're not looking at uh, the, you know, volcano right now or anything like that. So just back her down. There we go. Plus this thing, you know, like I said, I'm gonna get about a gallon and a half uh, boil off. If I have this thing on Hellfire mode the entire time, it's going to be an extreme amount of uh, boil off. Now, like I said before, if you do have, if you do boil off a little bit more than you were thinking, <clears throat> you can always uh, top up at the end with cold water. Um, uh, you know, even when it's hot, you could do that. But um, if you you know, are already done chilling and you're only in your fermenter at like four and a half gallons and you want to be at five, your calculations have already said that you're going to be at five and a half gallons. So your sugar level is about the same um, if you top up. And so you're supposed to have, if you, you know, according to your recipe, like this one, I, I want to have five and a half gallons in my fermenter because then when I dry hop and I lose uh, beer to the yeast cake and the transferring and all that, I want five gallons at the end of the day. <clears throat> I don't want to have four because it's the same amount of work no matter what, so you might as well have the amount of beer that you're looking to get. Um, so yeah, so if you're going to be doing it into your fermenter, I do recommend... Um, you know, getting, uh, you can either boil water, you want it be, to be sanitized, because, you know, at this point in time, sani you know, being sanitary and all that is not the forefront. You can kind of, you know, drop a spoon and it's all right or something like that. But once you're done chilling, that's when you want to be very uh, strict on being clean, because what we have here at the end of the day is a petri dish full of sugar, ready to go, and we only want the one uh, organism in there, which is our yeast. We don't want bacteria, we don't want a wild yeast in there, that can start to create off flavors uh, and some weird things. Um, and we only want the one thing in there, which is our uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, and our Chico strain flagship from Imperial Organic Yeast. Because we want that yeast strain to just eat away without any competition, we want it to be happy, uh, we don't want it to stress out. 
because just like us, when it's when we stress out, bad things can kind of happen. We feel gross and everything like that. So we want our yeast to be very happy because there is an old adage that says brewers make wort, but yeast makes beer. And that's exactly true. Without yeast, we wouldn't have beer or wine or anything like that. <clears throat> so uh, we have a really good boil going on right now. I might back her down just a smidge. There we go. Okay, so uh, let's take, uh, since we are literally watching wart boil right now, let's take uh, a little journey back in time. Um, like I said, I studied anthropology at Ohio State University. I won't say the Ohio State, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but uh, at Ohio State University, I studied anthropology with a focus on archaeology. And um, my last uh, year there, I actually focused on ancient fermentation. Um, There's a great book by Dr. Patrick McGovern. Uh, he uh, uh, is at Penn State and he's actually the molecular archaeologist that worked with dogfish head and uh, he has come out with some books and some papers on uh, ancient fermentation and so I drew heavily upon his work and the work of others and all that but my biggest thing is that when I was looking at the uh, history of beer <clears throat> it you know basically went to Mesopotamia and Sumeria and you know 5000 BC and there was tons of breweries and everything like that but I was always like what came before? What led to get you to that point where there was hundreds of breweries in you know, Sumeria and Mesopotamia and all that? And so that's really where I focus on. And so we'll take a, a little bit of a journey back in time uh, and uh, you know, see what led up to you know, a whole culture and um, civilization that was based on beer. So with that being said, um, <clears throat> We will do that. So um, where I want to go first is um, uh, basically the earliest primates. Uh, you know, 65 million years ago, there was volcanoes and then the meteor impact and everything like that. And the tiny uh, survivors of that impact and mass die off that killed off the dinosaurs um, and all that. The survivors were, for the most part, small little animals that uh, were not impacted by the drastic change. <clears throat> One of those smallest animals was actually our um, primate ancestor, and it was about the size of a small shrew, or what we call it, uh, a tree mouse or anything like that, or tree shrew. Um, and they had, uh, they kind of looked like a squirrel. They had little beady eyes on the sides of their heads, a long snout, and dentition for eating insects. They were very small, so their main uh, food was an insect. Well, uh, you know, about, uh, oh gosh, it's... You know, I want to say 54 million years ago or so, uh, ancient uh, primates took to the trees. So we went from being nocturnal and on the ground, and we went into this new area um, of the world in trees that were also evolving at that point. And that's actually where angiosperms, or fruit-bearing trees, started to evolve and produce fruit. Um, and so we were utilizing fruit as a new food source. We went, we went into the trees. Um, and because of that, because it's a three-dimensional uh, environment, now instead of, um, uh, you know, basically a two-dimensional, you know, being on the ground, now you're in a three-dimensional area, so you have branches and all these different things. The eyes of these earlier primates actually went from the side and shifted to the front of their skulls, and that gave us binocular vision, so that way when we jumped from one limb to another, we weren't going to miss and then fall into the deaths and everything like that. So having eyes in the front and having binocular vision was a really good uh, adaptation at that point. The the other adaptation that happened because of uh, the evolution of uh, fruiting trees was color vision. Um, because we were nocturnal before that, um, we didn't really need to see that much color. Um, but once we got to the trees and there was fruit around, uh, having the ability to see color uh, was a very uh, great step um, for our evolution. And that allowed us to utilize a food source that we never utilized before. Because if you think about think of like a peach or a plum or something like that, it turns red. And so when we were able to see the fruit turning red, we knew that it was uh, able to be easily digestible and uh, easily to break it down, and it was ready and it's gonna taste better, and so we were able to get to that, and then we were uh, the earliest primates were successful because of that. Well, the other thing, so basically that's during the Eocene uh, epoch, uh, 56 to 36 million years ago, uh, ancient primates took to the trees, 
And for the most part, uh, the world uh, as it is now was very similar at that point in time. Uh, South America and uh, Africa had split. North America was pretty much where we were. You still had the Tethys Sea between uh, uh, Africa and uh, Europe, uh, Asia. But for the most part, things were very much... Uh, India had not slammed into the uh, Asian continent yet, so you did not have the Himalayas. Um, but things were still very nice and green. Um, and so the thing is, is that when you have fruit, um, you will have fermentation because yeast, which is uh, wild, um, will be kind of waiting to get to that fruity substance, that sugary liquid that's inside the fruit. And that's why if you go to a vineyard or you see a plum tree, you'll kind of see like a powdery stuff on top of the fruits usually. That's actually wild yeast ready to go so that w when the fruit ruptures, the yeast can get in there and start eating away and then because of that, they're gonna create CO2. So you have the wafting aroma of fermenting fruit throughout the air. Um, you will have the breaking down of complex sugars into simple ones. And so that's when kind of the root starts to kind of rot a little bit. Um, and you'll also have the presence of alcohol. And so with the presence of alcohol, with ancient primates starting to utilize fruit as their major food source or for give awards, um, you will have uh, them eating alcoholic fruit. And so you will get uh, you know, drunk because there's alcohol present. Um, so that's basically what we talk about with the drunken monkey hypothesis. Proposes that the human attraction to ethanol is actually has a genetic basis due to the high dependence of fruit as a food source of the early uh, primate ancestor of Homo sapiens. Ethanol naturally occurs in ripe or overripened fruit, and consequently, early primates de developed a genetically based attraction to the substance. Because at that point in time, you're gonna fruit is not growing throughout the year, so you're gonna gorge yourself on as much fruit and alcohol as you can to build up a fat layer to survive the time of year that does not have any of that from there. So you're gonna gorge yourself. You're gonna be able to. Um, ingest the alcohol as a food source. So one of our, uh, there's a, a the thing called a tree shrew, and that's what they call a living, uh, 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 oh gosh, uh, a living fossil. And uh, it, it's still alive today, and what it does is it actually eats the palm sugar uh, or the palm sap on uh, fruiting trees of palm trees, and that stuff is highly alcoholic, and they can actually eat um, alcohol up to, was it 90 or 80 percent, I think, and they don't get sick or drunk. They actually can metabolize all of that alcohol and they utilize that as a food source. And so with that being said, because it's a living fossil, quote unquote, um, we can kind of see that's why we are able to actually ingest alcohol and drink a beer and an hour later we're not drunk. We can actually metabolize that through our liver and uh, we're utilizing that to uh, gain uh, uh, energy. So um, that's one of the, we just kind of lost it a little bit. Uh, throughout the ages um, from our most common ancestor. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is honey. Um, honey uh, is derived from bees. Bees go out and get pollen uh, from flowers. Um, and bees kind of started evolving um, highly, honeybees started really evolving right around the same time that these uh, flowering trees started evolving as well. Kind of makes sense, kind of a symbiotic relationship between the two. And so honey is one of the most energy dense foods that can be found in the natural world. It contains about 80 to 95 percent sugar, primarily fructose, which is a simple sugar, and glucose, also another simple sugar. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to break it down uh, and metabolize, so it's very uh, good for us. And it also has several uh, essential vitamins and minerals. Uh, honey that contains bee larva is an actual excellent high quality food source uh, full of energy and protein uh, and fats and uh, basically has been harvested for very much of human and hominoid uh, history. And you can actually go see, if you go, go ahead and Google it uh, and do honey hunters, you can actually see uh, cave paintings and rock uh, drawings of honey uh, hunters from way, way, way back. Um, there, and there actually is uh, still some honey hunters in, uh, in Tanzania. Um, uh, and there's still actually a hunter, I, th I believe that's the Hadzda, and um, they're uh, uh, hunter-gatherers that live uh, in Tanzania, on the border of Kenya and Tanzania, and uh, they actually have a really cool uh, symbiotic relationship with the bird. And the bird will actually s uh, seek out uh, beehives that has honey because when they do that they actually will go back and start whistling to the, the, the Hazda and the Hazda will go to where the bird takes them, uh, get smoke going, burn out the uh, bees, get the honey and then they always give honey to the bird so the bird is actually getting food through the relationship with the human so that's kind of a fun little thing that goes on with that. Um, 
as well. Um, so the really interesting thing uh, is that, um, and I'll cut this uh, pretty short, but um, the reason why we, uh, I believe and others believe that uh, humans have been eating honey for a very, very long time is we can actually, we've documented uh, chimpanzees in the West African forests uh, actually hunting honey. They go up into the trees or into logs and they have a diverse toolkit of branches and sticks that they will use to pound and get the, um, the honey uh, or the, the you know the uh, the log hole opened up kind of in a larger and then they'll actually chew on a stick get it frayed jam it in there swirl it around and then pull out honey and then they start eating honey and the significance of that is that if they are doing that most likely our our common ancestor between seven and nine million years ago also did that too and so because of that hypothesizing of that activity that we're seeing today in our most common ancestor uh, and cousin that shares you know was it 98% of our DNA? Um, because honey ferments naturally when diluted to a 70-30% ratio, um, it's most likely that uh, we were consuming a honey-like uh, mead uh, early on. Because um, if you have a honey hive and a rainstorm comes in, and it gets you to that 70% water, 30% honey. Uh, yeast is already there, and that's actually the precursor to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the yeast that we use to ferment now with our beers. It's sitting there dormant in the high sugary uh, uh, environment, and as soon as it gets to that ratio, it kicks on and starts fermenting, sending out CO2, wafting into the air, and, mo and other animals will go to it. And if we see that chimpanzees are eating honey, honey perhaps maybe our, uh, our closest living ancestor, or even also the Australopithecines um, from like four million years ago were doing that as well and so they might have been ingesting alcohol and where that plays a key factor is that a recent study actually saw that there's a gene in our saliva um, that they found that mutated drastically about nine million years ago that allowed us to actually um, utilize alcohol as uh, and metabolize it as a food source much more than it was previously. So we actually jumped uh, uh, a ton uh, from being able to like you know ingest a little bit of alcohol to all of a sudden being able to ingest a lot and not getting sick. So it was a food source. So that says that we were actually ingesting either fermenting fruits or potentially honey uh, as well. But. Yeah, so that's kind of like a, a basis of why we might be attracted to um, ethanol or alcohol and uh, utilizing it. So <clears throat> I think it's a good time to take another break, uh, get some water. It is rather hot and you're standing between a couple of burners. Um, so we're going to watch a little video here about uh, Wolves and People, Newburgh, Oregon. Sweet. Uh, really cool brewery that does a lot of uh, foraging and kind of using ingredients off the land. Um, and we'll uh, we'll cut away to that in a second here, and it'll be it'll be a pretty good, good video. Sounds good. So, uh, Can't wait. We're drawing as much as we can from not only our own farm but the farms in the area, and I think to me that's part of the essence of farmhouse brewing. It's an incredible, you know, stroke of good luck to be here in this place where there's a revival in small farms and family farms and we see the seasonal uh, effect every day in the brewery. When something comes ripe, we're thinking about what to brew with it and how we can fit that into our schedules. We're at Springbrook Hazelnut Farm. Uh, this is uh, the farm where I grew up. Uh, after college, I had an amazing opportunity. I won a grant to study beer brewing around the world. The whole time, I was sort of secretly thinking, uh, someday I'll have my own brewery, and asking brewers everywhere I went how they did it, why they used the techniques they used, why they preserved methods of making beer that were uh, outmoded you know, decades or even centuries before. The whole time harboring this idea that I might come back and build a brewery at the farm where I grew up, uh, not having any idea how hard it would really be to take this old barn and turn it into uh, a somewhat modern farmhouse brewery. One of the things I value most in my life would be community. And if you were to be thinking about farmhouse brewing in a community sense, it would be the way that it would have been done, right? You, you're, you're not getting things from halfway across the world. You're using what you've got. Um, and that really uh, makes me feel really good about what we do because we're either supporting ourselves or we're supporting the local economy surrounding us with locally awesome grown stuff. 
One of the best things about Farmhouse is that it's pretty nondescript, so we get to have a lot of fun with, with that. And Farmhouse, we take to mean working with a lot of local farmers, using products from the farm here, um, and then paying homage to styles of old. I think that our, our success is owed every bit to, uh, to that um, incredible generosity that the community has shown us here in Newburgh, in Portland, in the Pacific Northwest, and, and even beyond. Uh, I'm really, really grateful and honored to have the, the chance to do this at all. All right, so All right. we are welcome back. We are still here. We are still brewing a batch of beer, and this is a pale ale, um, <clears throat> Northwest style pale ale. Uh, Jesse, if you want to kind of fill people in where we are in the brewing process for people that haven't really been watching the whole thing, maybe they're yeah. tuning in and out, um, and we can kind of keep it going. Yeah, so uh, let's see. We are. We started boiling at 1.30, so we're about 20 minutes in. Um, so, you know, a third of the way uh, through the boil. Um, we still have another uh, 25, 30 minutes before our next um, addition. Um, because with this pale ale, we're really focusing on uh, hop flavor and aroma. And so we just did a nice little bittering charge uh, called a first ward hop um, before it even started boiling. Um, and then we're going to boil through and then do a huge addition at 10 minutes and then uh, zero minutes or flame out. And really lock in that aroma. So uh, we started off about nine and a half gallons or so. Uh, we're down about, uh, we'll say nine-ish um, <clears throat> going there. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty much right on track. Um, once again, you know, we're going to be uh, the flavor and aroma uh, comp uh, components of this beer is going to be Cascade and Centennial, really classic hops, uh, especially for the West Coast, but um, really good uh, citrusy, some pink grapefruit, some hoppy, um, uh, and this, you know, think of, uh, you know, a really good pale ale uh, that is, the, you know, the quintessential American pale ale is really C Sierra Nevada's, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, pale ale. Um, and that is actually has a really cool story behind it. Um, back in the late, or the mid-70s, um, <clears throat> Cascade was introduced in the early 70s. Uh, it had not really been around. It was released by uh, Oregon State, I believe, um, yeah. hop department, and uh, nobody wanted it. No one, they thought it was too pungent, too big for the beers, because that was really during the macro times of... Right. Uh, of Everyone wanted just the same yeah, basic yeah. hop. And uh, uh, coincidentally enough, uh, Coors was the company that saved that hop. No one was buying that hop, hmm. and Coors decided to go in and bought it and contracted it, so then they were able to grow it. And they were just using it in little doses because it was a little too much for them. And then uh, a little brewery um, in uh, San Francisco, Anchor, uh, decided to uh, try the hop, and they put it into their Liberty Ale. And uh, that was really the first, um, besides the, uh, um, oh gosh, what's the name? Um, Oh, I'm totally spacing on it, but uh, anyways, that was really like the first true like American IPA of the modern mm. world, um, and they used uh, Cascade. And so um, once that happened, then kind of uh, talk really started circulating around the brewing world in the mid '70s, and then in the uh, late '70s, early '80s, that's when Sierra Nevada started making their pale ale, and it took off from there. Um, a heavy cool. component of Cascade in that one. Yeah, yeah, and the so. other hop we're using in this one is uh, Centennial. Yeah. And Centennial was actually developed as like super Cascade. That's right. Yeah, that was that's the other uh, moniker and for it. And then Sierra Nevada for their Torpedo IPA. That was what they went ah, heavily into. gotcha. So that was kind of like the the pale was the Cascade, and then the IPA was the super Cascade. Oh, so I like that. And then also, if you guys have had it, uh, Bell's uh, Two Hearted Ale, which is also like one of the top performing IPAs in the country on a lot of lists and everything, is all Centennial. Yeah. Yeah, um, on that one. So, <coughs> all right. So yeah, so two great hops in a in a nice simple American pale ale. Uh, this should be a really good drinker um, and uh, very uh, familiar with anybody who drinks it if they uh, you know grow up with uh, craft beer and stuff like that. So yeah, and be before we took a little break, you were really talking about kind of why humans can process alcohol and mm -hmm. stuff like that. 
Um, is, there, is there more to the story? Is yeah, there's a lot to the story. <laughs> um, I'm kind of just giving you the cliff notes um, when it comes to this stuff. Um, you know, like I said, Dr. Pat McGovern of uh, Penn State, he has literally written the book um, on this stuff. And to kind of give you a, a, an idea of what a molecular archaeologist does, so for example, uh, Dogfish Head, they have their Midas Touch. Um, that is a beer um, that came from the actual tomb of King Midas, so from Aesop's fables and all that kind of stuff, there was an actual King Midas. Um, he might not have had the uh, golden touch to turn everything into gold, but uh, he was definitely popular because his tomb uh, was actually the biggest uh, cache of, um, uh, of uh, formal uh, pottery that we've ever found. And so what Pat McGovern did was when he saw this whole big tomb full of uh, uh, wares throughout, he noticed that there was a little bit of uh, residual liquid uh, in this tomb, and so he... Uh, or at least a residue that so it showed that there was liquid in these vessels. So we actually took a, b a molecular analysis of these um, uh, uh, residues and found that it contained um, the elements from both beer, wine, and mead. Uh, so there was trace amounts of wax in there that said that there was honey. There was trace amounts of uh, tartaric acid, which shows that there was grapes. And then there was also a little bit of beer stone, um, which shows that there was um, uh, uh, a wart-like substance in there. And so uh, based on that, and then also trace amounts of what uh, we would know as saffron. And so he went out and kind of put out the word, and Dogfish Head, Sam Calgione's, uh, uh was able to brew a beer that was most like that. And so that was literally what they call a liquid time capsule. And so um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, the ancient ales and kind of ancient brewing, I do highly recommend Pat McGovern's books, Uncorking the Past. And then he also just came out with a book last summer um, that I was actually lucky enough to get him to sign my book at HomebrewCon in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota last year. Um, and I was able to talk to him a little bit about this stuff. And he's a great guy. Um, so I can't talk about him uh, enough. He's awesome. So he kind of inspired me to really look at the past of brewing. And because of my anthropological background, I really wanted to look to see why we make beer. Why is alcohol so prevalent in our uh, society and um, as one of the hallmarks to everything and I kind of found some really interesting things so we talked previously about you know ancient primates took to the trees started eating fruit fruit um, as its own because it has sugar and there's wild yeast everywhere will start to ferment animals eat the f fermenting fruit get drunk and have a propensity to uh, gorge themselves so that they, they can survive the dry times when there is no fruit <clears throat> so because of that that's why we humans in general love sugar and fat that's why, you know, candy and fatty foods, like, we can't help ourselves but gorge on it because that we have a genetic propensity to do that uh, in the case that something happens. So that's why we put on fat when we eat a lot of sugar and fat um, for that specific reason. So that if anything were to happen, we can actually survive a little bit longer. Um, so, the next thing I went into was utilizing honey. Uh, honey is what they call a superfood. It's very basic sugar, so you can eat it and not spend a lot of time digesting it. Um, it goes straight into the bloodstream for the most part and then straight to the brain. So, where uh, I want to take it from there is uh, going with the brain. So, um, in our uh, human history uh, and before humans, um, uh, if any of you out there are familiar with the um, Australopithecine Lucy, uh, she was very popular back in the late 70s when the Leakeys discovered her in the East uh, African Rift Valley. Uh, she basically was a fossilized skeleton that had hallmarks of both apes and um, humans. So she walked upright uh, and had a modern pelvis, um, but her fingers were curved, which means that she was in the trees a lot, so she would be able to actually uh, climb very easily. Um, and so uh, Australopithecines are basically, you know, uh, you know, four to three million years old, depending on all that. Well, a really interesting thing is that when we come upon these fossils, what we can do is make an endocast. An endocast is we take the fossilized skull, piece it back together again, fill the skull cavity where the brain was with an epoxy or a putty, and then we take the, uh, the uh, skull apart, and now we actually have a cast of their actual brain. When we live, our brains are constantly, with our uh, cardiovascular system, pulsing against our skull. And what that does is it, uh, as it pulsates against our skull, it actually creates ridges on the inside of our skull where our uh, folds of our brain are, all the little cracks that give us our modern uh, uh, um, ability to think. And so when we did that, we expected, everyone thinks that, you know, you went from small brains to big brains, and once you had big brains, then all of a sudden you're modern and you can think a lot better. Well, the 
interesting thing about these endocasts is that um, it shocked us. These endocasts and ophthalmopithecines actually showed a modern reorganization of the brain in the terms of folds and all these things as what we have today. And so what we have found is that it wasn't brain size small, big, and then it became a modern looking brain. It was actually modern looking brain small, and then as we evolved, our brains just got bigger. So we were actually able to think on our feet a lot uh, better way back when. Um, and we, our brains were about the same size of a chimpanzee, but our folds were a lot more advanced. So we were obviously thinkers. Um, well, one of the only ways that you can actually get a reorganization of the brain is when food is um, not necessarily as scarce as, as it was, and you're utilizing less energy to digest your food so that more energy can actually go to your brain development. And what happens with that is um, you need to have a either cooked foods, so the uh, food is broken down so it's easier to digest, um, or simpler foods. So for example, when you eat a raw food or have highly undigestible foods, you need a bigger uh, stomach cavity to uh, help digestion. And when you uh, have cooked foods or simpler foods, um, you don't need all that uh, energy going to your gut. It can go straight to your brain and your brain can develop. And so one of the things is that, okay, well, was that when we started cooking food or anything like that? Perhaps. You know, we, we have an idea of the earliest uh, evidence of fire, but we really don't know how far back it really goes. Perhaps we were taking advantage of a lightning strike or anything like that. But in my personal opinion, since we saw the honey hunting uh, chimpanzees of, of the Loango uh, forest in West Africa, we can uh, hypothesize that our most common ancestors were doing the same. And so if we're utilizing uh, honey as a part of of our uh, diet, uh, more of an omnivore diet than a frugivore, which means fruit-based uh, diet, um, then because of the simple sugars and everything in the honey, it allowed more energy to go to our brain. So that's when perhaps in a reorganization of the brain developed. And if we were eating honey based on the brain uh, dynamics, that means with the simple uh, uh, ease of fermentation to naturally occur in honey, um, we might have actually been eating, uh, 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 drinking or uh, consuming an alcohol like uh, beverage out of a tree or a log or somewhere um, a lot earlier on. And the onset of drinking alcohol uh, and consuming it uh, actually does have its health benefits. Moderate drinkers are actually healthier than non-drinkers or binge drinkers. And so, um, you know, you get a better cardiovascular system, you might live a little bit longer. The water you're drinking is actually um, a little uh, healthier because just the presence of alcohol alone will kill off any harmful bacteria. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so we can kind of hypothesize that our attraction to alcohol developed really early on and perhaps we even figured out of drinking alcohol from a tree from honey. And so where that takes us is actually to the uh, Fertile Crescent. Um, for millions of years, waves and waves of hominins and hominoids were, go uh, excuse me, were going through the Middle East, through the Fertile Crescent, and uh, expanding around the world. We've even seen um, evidence of uh, uh, Homo erectus getting to the Philippines and such a long, long time ago. Um, and uh, relatively speaking, grain uh, or grass seeds um, is uh, a newer uh, evolution of uh, grass plants, but perhaps it was a little bit you know, older. Um, we're still trying to figure out how old it really goes. But for the most part, during the uh, middle parts of the Ice Age and everything, when things went away uh, or the glaciers retreated and everything, uh, the Fertile Crescent was a really lush place. It's not really what it was today. Um, it's really, uh, uh, there's been some severe des desertification uh, in the Middle East, but you know, uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, it was lush, green, full of forests and all of that. And so when our earliest ancestors, perhaps Australopithecines or Homo erectus or even Homo habilis um, or even uh, archaic Homo sapiens that then split into Neanderthals, Dianozovians and all of that, um, perhaps they, uh, like other hunter-gatherers, were going to utilize every food source that they could find. And in Africa, they do have millet and other kind of grass seeds that we utilize for food. And so moving into a new area, we would practice what's called catchment uh, strategy, where you move around, you use, utilize the uh, resources in the area, and then you leave, you go here, and then you might come back to it. Well, I think it's safe to say that earlier on we figured out that grains um, were a food source. They're full of uh, starches and uh, complex sugars and everything. Um, and then I would say that if you've ever tasted grain on your own, you're not really going to pick it and then just pop it in your mouth. You can, but it's actually really 
hard to chew, it's hard to digest, and it's actually really bad for your teeth because inside uh, grass seeds is something called phytoliths. Phytoliths are actually tiny, tiny little microscopic stones um, from the minerals uh, that, the soil, that the plant grew from the soil, and it can actually degrade your teeth. And our enamel is hard, but it's not that hard to withstand the onslaught of those things. So it is, uh, basically, it's easy to say that when hunter-gatherer bands harvested wild grains, it's safe to say that they found out fairly quickly that so Soaking and the harvested grain in water greatly improve the consistency um, and digestion of the food. So just by putting a little bit of warm water uh, in with the grains made it uh, softer. It broke it down. We might have had like a, a malting uh, or you know malting happening, and then you do it again, and now all of a sudden you have a nice sugary sweet liquid. Um, it's nutritious. It's broken down even more, so you don't have to digest it as much. So once again, more uh, energy going to your brain. And then if you let it sit out in a vessel. Um, or anywhere, uh, wild yeast is going to hit and then start fermenting it. And, is, and, I, th and I, I think, and as well as some others, and we hypothesize that, um, you know, that happened a lot earlier than uh, originally thought. Um, and so once again, uh, you know, as soon as you figured out that you could get the same kind of alcohol from grain and not have to search out for honey and only getting it one point in time of the year or so, um, all of a sudden you had a little bit more control. And the catchment strategy actually helped us domesticate grain because we would leave an area and then come back maybe the next year and then there's uh, grains uh, that were growing, you know, wheats and all that kind of stuff growing again and barleys. And because it was ones that we selected for, um, it was easier to harvest. Because wild grains, the part that connects the seed to the actual plant are very brittle. And it makes sense. If a bird lands on it or if we hit it, the, the uh, plant seeds distribute themselves very easily. And so we actually selected for grains that had a hard brackis. And that's the part that connects it. So if we're selecting for that, that means we can actually take a woven basket and a branch and collect the grains instead of trying trying to like, oh crap, and trying to catch all these things. So you're not going to spend as much time and effort getting as much. Um, and so that's the really the hallmarks of domestication. And as soon as we figured that out, um, we were drinking beers uh, for the most part. Um, the interesting thing is that malting, uh, we kind of didn't really cover that, but malting is you get a seed, like a grain or anything like that, you get it wet. And you kind of keep it warm for like a day or two, and you're basically simulating uh, or stimulating the growth process of a seed. You know, you plant a seed, you see the little thing come out, and it's growing. What it's doing is that seed is actually an energy storehouse full of complex carbohydrates and starches uh, with enzymes. And so we actually utilize the seed to do all a lot of the work for us to break down those complex sugars into simple ones, so that when we mash it we can utilize those enzymes that have been enzymes that have been activated and convert things over really easily. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so basically, um, I, you know, I hypothesize because of, oh yeah, so where I was getting to is that we've actually found charred grains because once you're done malting, you're gonna then kiln it or dry it out either next to a fire or put it out to stop that uh, growing process and uh, so that the seed doesn't basically utilize all of the sugar. And so we've actually found charred remains of grains in levels of caves and everywhere that date back you know, at least 20,000, if not 40,000 years. We've even found charred remains, or charred remains of grains in Neanderthal levels in, the, uh, uh, in Israel, um, which is a very interesting uh, idea, and that basically was like 45,000 years ago. So, you know, the thing about all of this is that it's only hypothesis because a lot of this stuff is organically based, so it doesn't really, you know, uh, stay in the archaeological, uh, you know, uh, stratas, but we can hypothesis based on a lot of this stuff. So, for the most part, I believe and others believe that uh, our consumption of alcohol goes back a long way. And uh, if that is the case, you know, think about um, the hallmark service of our culture, music, um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, artwork and all these things that, you know, uh, if anything, just speech. Uh, you sit down next to a fire, and if you're consuming alcohol, it is a social lubricant, so you might be more inclined to talk to your neighbor, and that's when we might get bigger communities because of that communication. Um, the communication, in addition to hunting, is uh, improved because of just the consumption of alcohol. Um, and so you can start to see the, the hallmarks of our, uh, of our humanity coming out because of our 
uh, use of beer. So that's where I'll end it today. Um, I will talk about this uh, in more detail uh, later on uh, in other episodes and stuff like that. But uh, I just wanted to give you a quick primer on uh, on all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's that's really really cool, really interesting stuff. Um, and I know that when you do the the homebrew classes and stuff, that's one of the things that a lot of people take away. Is yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's stuff that you don't you don't think about. You know, it's like I, yeah, I like drinking beer. I like enjoying beer. Right. But man, I don't know why, and I don't know how that's kind of helped our culture. You mm -hmm. know. Develop. Yeah, and once you start putting everything kind of together, it just kind of makes sense. You yeah. know, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, we're going to take another little break. Um, we have about 20 minutes left Perfect. in the boil. Um, so we're going to cut away to a, another video from Hop Stories. And um, it should be, we'll, we'll come back shortly. Yeah, so. stay tuned. All right, enjoy. If I could be a beer, what style of beer would I be? Um, I'd be an Irish stout. I would be a Goza because it's kind of salty and kind of bitey, a little bit snarky, kind of like me. Probably a Gosa. I'm pretty salty, kind of bitter. Um, yeah, kind of give a lot of people heartburn. I would be a Gosa because people can't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> I'd be a foreign extra stout. Something sweet, you know, like something dark, something roasty, but not as bitter as you would think. <laughs> I think I would be a slightly sour, mature barrel aged pretty mild, dark, smooth beer. <laughs> it's kind of my personality, I think. If I were a beer, I would definitely be some sort of foraged uh, wild sage and western red cedar red ale. An arrogant bastard. <laughs> Let's see. I'd be, an, I'd, I'd be an Irish red ale. Irish, I got a little heft, a little sweet, malty, uh, not, not too bitter. You know, but just a little. <laughs> Be like a suicide of a bunch of beers blended up together, like suicide, no diet, a little bit of everything. Drink it up. <laughs> oh man, probably be a little fruity. Um, you know, I'd be a Belgian quad. Like an American light lager or something, because like, I have like very little body to me, right? All right, so we are here today with uh, Jesse from Ambrosis Brewing School. School of Brewing. School yeah. of Brewing. I'm going to get it one of these times <laughs> when we come back. And uh, we're brewing a pale ale, Northwest Pale Ale. Um, we have about 20 minutes left in the boil, and we're going to start adding hops in a little bit. Yeah. Um, and before we do that, um, I'm going to let Jesse kind of fill you in on some more specs about the beer and... We'll, we'll kind of keep going. Yeah. This is this yeah. a live show, so this is the first time we've ever done this, and man, I'm having a blast. <clears throat> yeah, no, this is great. I'm having a great time. All right, so what, what's, what's coming up next? <clears throat> uh, excuse me. So, uh, yeah, so uh, in about a f five minutes or so, I'm going to add our uh, uh, World Flock tablet. And that is our uh, fining agent. Uh, uh, World Flock tablets are basically the tab tabletized form of Irish moss. And Irish moss is neither Irish nor a moss. It's actually a seaweed found on the ocean floor. Um, and what it does is when you add it in dry form to your boiling wort, uh, it kind of opens up and it sucks in. It's kind of sticky and everything. It sucks in all the proteins and particulates and everything. So then when you chill, it, when it cools down, it gets really heavy and it drops to the bottom of your kettle and so that way you have nice clean wort going into your okay. fermenter. Okay. And I found that the cleaner the wort going into the fermenter, the cleaner the beer. Um, and at that point in time, I'll also add a little bit of yeast nutrient. Um, I found that uh, adding yeast nutrient to the boil just uh, gives the yeast a little bit more food to chew on. Um, if you didn't add it, it's not like you're starving the yeast, um, but yeast are very gluttonous, so the more you can feed them and make them happy, the healthier they'll be um, and produce a really good quaffable beer for you. So um, I'll add a little bit of that to, uh, to the uh, wort, and then basically uh, after that we will... Um, uh, go ahead and uh, add the hops. And also, you know, um, if you want, uh, we'd love to get some of your feedback, so please feel free to ask questions to us. Uh, we will definitely answer them for you uh, live and uh, go from there. So if you have a question that's burning you, uh, just uh, ask away and we'll do our best to answer it 
as well as we can. So um, we'll go from there. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so you know we're about uh, just on just over eight gallons left. So we're getting a really good uh, uh, voracious uh, boil going on right now. So <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so let's see what we got here. So I'm gonna check out my recipe. So um, if you choose to do either whorl flock tablets or Irish moss, um, for a five gallon batch, if you use a whorl flock tablet, it's just one tablet. If you use Irish moss, it's about a teaspoon. So um, <clears throat> let's see where we're at. Perfect, so we're at 15 minutes, so bloop, right there. Um, that's as simple it is as it can be. And then um, I like to use the Y yeast uh, beer nutrient blend. Um, I've just found that uh, it works. I have some friends of mine that are also brewers uh, and they use this as well and have had really good results. And once again, uh, we're looking for the yeast to be very happy, ferment away without any competition or anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just a nice little added bonus uh, to help them. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my trusty measuring spoons and then do about, um, a half teaspoon or so. Some people do a half, some people do a teaspoon. I believe this, they actually recommend a half teaspoon. If it's a bigger beer, I generally go a, a full teaspoon just so that it has a little bit more uh, uh, food to it. So I just go ahead and put that in there. You can actually add yeast nutrient in uh, fermentation away, I, or when fermentation is happening, but I personally just like to put it in <clears throat> at this point in time. I know it's dissolved. I know that because of the boiling, if there was anything on it, it it's completely safe. Um, and I like to just kind of give it a stir. Um, even though it's boiling, I still like to kind of get it stirred in just to kind of give it a little bit. Plus that whirl flock tablet has kind of been, ta you know, just dissolving away. Um, so I want to make sure that it's, you know, all evenly in there from there. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my wort chiller into the boil kettle. So that way the hot wort can splash against it, sanitize it, and I don't have to worry about anything. Even though I cleaned it pretty well, um, it's just a good way uh, to prevent any potentials for uh, contamination. So I'm gonna go ahead and hook up my trusty hose. I will say, um, I'll show this to you guys. Um, this is a really good work chiller um, that I had. It's, uh, you can use it for both five and 10 gallon batches. Um, but I like to put uh, quick disconnects on my thing. So I have a nice uh, hose quick disconnect. And so I can just basically just go right on there like that and not have to worry about anything. Um, this is going to splash on me, so let's see here. I'll get my other hose real quick. Uh, no. Just keep looking pretty. Okay. This is kind of having a live show. Things just kind of... There we go. Right. This is why you do a pilot episode. Figure out everything. <laughs> I do have a quick question for all of you guys watching. Uh, how many of you will be going to HomebrewCon down in uh, sunny Portland, Oregon in the next week or so? Funnily enough, I'm actually going to Bend, uh, Oregon on Thursday. Uh, and then staying till Monday. And then I'll be hopping back down to Portland. Unfortunately, I won't be there on Wednesday uh, for the uh, pre-parties uh, and all that, but I will be coming uh, late Thursday night and then, of course, staying there Friday and then going into the sessions both Friday and Saturday. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you guys are down there and you see me around, make sure to say hi. Um, I'd love to talk about brewing with, with anyone who wants to listen and uh, enjoy the awesome uh, homebrew con. Uh, in Portland, so it should be pretty fun. So yeah, so I've gone ahead and put the war chiller in, so that's just, I kind of like to just splash it around, make sure everything gets in contact. Um, it's not a detriment to the beer. Um, it stopped rolling boil, but um, it's still hot enough, you know, all that. And we should be coming up pretty close <coughs> to, um, excuse me, to adding our hops. So uh, I'll go ahead and get that measured out. All right, while you're measuring some hops, um, I just poured a beer for you. Ooh. Uh, Polyrhythmo. It's from Standard Brewing Company. 
What a great and color. Yeah, it's wow. uh, mixed culture fermented in oak, re-fermented on blackberries, Ooh. bottle conditioned. This is really smooth. So Yeah, it's really easy to drink. I figured mm. that'd be a nice uh, nice beer for drinking perfect. on a hot day. It's perfect. While brewing, of course. That's right. All right. So I'm just going to measure out my Cascade <clears throat> and measure out my Centennial hops. I probably should have had a scissors. My wife always hates when I open things up with my teeth, so. We'll remember that for next episode. Make sure to get Jesse his scissors. Otherwise, his wife will yell at him. All right, there's that. <clears throat> and then get the Centennials. All right. Perfect, all right, it's 220, so let's go ahead and add. Got a measured out half ounce each at 10 minutes of Cascade and Centennial. And once, I, once again, we're trying to shoot for about 40 IBUs. Um, so the next top edition is gonna be an ounce of each at flame out. Still gonna give us a good amount of IBUs, but uh, 40 is a pretty good number when it comes to a pale ale. You can go <clears throat> a little lower, a little higher, depending on the hop type. But like I said before, you know, think about the quality or the, uh, <clears throat> of what your hops actually will be bringing to the table. If they're very uh, voracious and uh, big in flavor and bitterness, maybe dial back. Um, a really good IPA uh, here in the Seattle area is Ruben's Crikey IPA. And uh, that's an IPA that's actually only 50 IBUs, but it tastes a lot more than that because I think the hops they choose just have a little bit bigger punch to them. So they don't need that IBU uh, backbone to really make it an IPA uh, with those specific hops. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get this ready because sometimes I can forget. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get my hops uh, 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 measured out now. You know, it's funny, I, I always get uh, <clears throat> a little self-conscious of, uh, of silence, you know, when I'm on video and stuff like that, but when I was in a jazz band back in high school and college and stuff like that, silence was actually the best note, so I hope you're appreciating the, the silence of this brew day. All right, so that's all weighed out, ready to go for the end of the boil. And uh, do we have any questions that have been popping up at all yet, or? Uh, let me take a look here. Um, I mean, we've, we had some questions earlier about the recipe. Mm -hmm. So there is a link in the, in the comment section that goes to the recipe. Great, great. Um, other than that, uh, no questions going on right now. Cool. So. Yeah, no problem. And I would say, you know, if you guys uh, want to brew this recipe, like I said, we will. Uh, we have the uh, recipe and the beersmith file available for you. And uh, if you do brew it at home, we'd love to hear your feedback on what you think of this. So, uh, you know, um, send us a written response, or it'd be kind of fun if you wanted to take a small video um, of you drinking the beer, trying it. Um, we might have some tasting notes uh, coming up down the road when this beer is all completely done. So it'd be kind of fun to do a tasting. A uh, little video and uh, get that to you guys, but uh, yeah, you know that's the beauty of homebrewing. Um, one of the fun things that I've done before, I'd like to do it again, and it's always a, a an interesting thing is actually uh, you know three or more brewers brewing the exact same beer recipe on their system and then actually comparing the beers uh, down the road because it's surprising at how different things can be just based on the system. Um, with all that, have you had that experience in the past? Yeah, yeah, you know, if I, if I would probably take this recipe and brew it on, I mean, I'm, I do a brew in a bag, so it's mm -hmm. slightly different, you know, I'm not doing the three tier system and stuff like that, and I'm sure it would be a totally different beer, even if it's the same recipe, yeah. even if we did the same water treatment and everything. Yeah. Um, because since we're at my house, it'd be the same hose and everything, like, yep. but it'd be totally different beer. Yep. I think some of that too is the homebrewer and homebrewer. We were, we were talking before, getting uh, getting this kind of planned about how we're both kind of lazy homebrewers when we're just brewing like for fun 
Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, I'd, I'd probably miss some temps or something like that, but I bet both beers would be delicious. They'd just oh, be yeah. a little bit different. Well, you know, and like, you know, because I have a little one and stuff like that, sometimes the mash is two hours, maybe three <laughs> hours, just depends on how the morning is going. Um, I personally like to, um, I don't like to get up too early. I know some other brewers will get up like at 4.30 and start brewing so that by the time their kids are awake, they're pretty much done. Um, I can't do that. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, there's some times where I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll be going to the library in the morning and all that. So I'm like, oh, I'll get mashed in and then the library turns into this and then that, and then <laughs> I gotta get lunch ready, and then by the time she's down for a nap, it's been three hours. I will say, the longer the mash, the better conversion. Um, I've uh, overshot my gravity a few times by just letting it sit longer. Yeah. So there yeah. could be something said um, about that. Um, perhaps it's because it's going from high temp to low temp, so you're getting more fermentables out of it as well, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I know, I always lo lose a little bit of malt to uh Little hands snacking. Ah, um, yes. I'll, I wa I'll weigh it out, and all of a sudden, I'll have lost a handful. So. Yeah, Clara um, really loves getting in there and scooping it around and moving it around, so like yeah. that. That's for sure. Um, one other thing, I don't know if you guys can see this on the camera or not, but um, as it is boiling down, sometimes uh, hop can actually get stuck to the side of the kettle. So we actually have that kind of going on right here with the latest addition. So that means the hops, it's not a significant amount, but it is something that I like to point out. And I just like to kind of splash it, get it back into the wort, get it utilizing and not losing any of that precious hop aroma and flavor with that. So, but yeah. Right, and obviously where, where it's- Where are we at time-wise? Uh, time-wise, we have five minutes left. Almost to the end. Let's see. Yeah, and we're using Beersmith over here to kind of formulate the recipe. <coughs> and you can see your numbers and stuff like that um, ahead of time, so you kind of know what to expect. Yeah. Um, he just came out with a new version of it. I haven't gotten a chance to check it out yet. I haven't either. It just came out like Saturday, I think. Or yeah, I'm sure like there'll that. be demos for it at HomebrewCon and stuff in Portland. Yeah, I'm actually um, looking forward to talking to Brad Smith about some things that I've noticed with Beersmith too that hopefully he's addressed uh, yeah. with a newer version. Yeah, the, the one comment I've seen is it doesn't look that much different, but I'm, I'm sure stuff has changed under the hood and Yeah, like that, I so. think one of his, uh, he was touting that, um, you know, w with those of us who are trying to, you know, the new method of the hazy, juicy, New Englandy things and all that kind of stuff, the IPAs, pale ales, a lot of the hop charge is uh, post-boil hmm. and um, a lot of those styles are restrained bitterness and so with Beersmith 2, it's kind of hard to calculate IBUs uh, for post boiling right, right. and one of the things that he's touting is that he will give you actual IBUs for 180 degree amounts 170 degree okay. and what you can expect on that so it's a little bit more dialed in calculations um, so I am excited to, to utilize that and see where it is because I know that sometimes you know it might be calculated 20 IBUs but it tastes more like 50 or something right, like that right. so. or, <clears throat> or it's calculated for 150 and it's actually only around 70 exactly yeah yep yep yeah. But yeah, I will say, you know, um, I personally like Beersmith. Um, it works really great for me. It allows me to make the beer first um, digitally. Um, and I can really figure out what the color is, the gravity is, the alcohol, bitterness, and all that kind of stuff. I've been able to uh, dial in with my equipment setup so I know at the end of the day, for the most part, um, it's going to be this. So it is a great tool. There are others out there that work. Um, but uh, I will say the thing I like about Beersmith is that Brad does a good, a, does a good job of updating. So yeah. I just noticed that uh, Skagit Valley malts are yeah. now up on that, so that makes it easier to plug that stuff yeah. in. Imperial yeast is Imperial. in there as well, yep. so you can you can really find the specific ingredients. You're not just saying, hey, this is just a basic two row, or this is just a right. an ale yeast. You can figure out what is is happening and. Mm -hmm see it happen. So Brad Smith, if you're listening, <laughs> you know. Um, all right, so we're getting there. Uh, once again, getting some hops up on the side. Let's see where we are. We got two minutes, two minutes. Um, so yeah, so I think this is going pretty good. Everything, the wort is looking nice. Once again, uh, once we'll chill, I'll take um, 
uh, uh, refractometer gravity reading to make sure where we're at. Um, and then once we're done chilling, I'll pull the work chiller out, see where our level is at for the volume of the uh, post boil. Um, and then, you know, depending on how voracious the boil was, I might actually have to top up a little bit of water or anything like that. But um, if we do, that's great, um, if not perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, and then um, chilling, hopefully, since it is a warmer day and it is summer, city water is a little bit warmer uh, than it is uh, in the winter and fall and uh, months and everything. So it might take a little bit more time to chill uh, all the way down, but generally speaking, it's between 20 and 30 minutes, uh, depending. Um, sometimes you can get 50 minutes. Uh, I actually have, this is my second wort chiller, um, and I have a smaller one that I started off with, and I think once we start getting into like the high 80s, 90s and stuff, I'm actually going to take that, connect it to the uh, uh, water in line, and I'm going to put that in my cooler with ice and a little bit of salt. And that will super chill the, the water going to the chiller, and then out so hopefully I can actually chill a lot faster because once again chilling faster uh, is a benefit the faster you can chill um, the less time bacteria that's floating through the air and all that kind of can get into your wart um, and also you get a really good cold break so we talked about hot break and cold break is basically all the proteins and everything uh, dropping out so that way you have really nice clear uh, wart going into your fermenter so we're pretty much done uh, with the boil I'm gonna go ahead and add the hops so let's go ahead and just put those straight in like that. Boom. And Eric, if I could get you to go turn on the hose. I can do that. Perfect. So uh, if you were here, folks watching us on the interwebs, uh, you would be able to smell. Brandon, can you smell all the hops coming through? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and so once again, um, if we wanted to infuse even more hop aroma, we would actually chill to 180 degrees, hit it with another batch. But this is just standard pale ale. We don't want it to be overly uh, hop flavored, overly yeah. aromic or aromatic. Um, we just want a really nice, simple pale ale that has the hallmarks of uh, the West Coast style. <clears throat> the other thing I really like about this um, brew kettle is with an immersion chiller, this lid has a little attachment where I can cover and go like that. So um, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Uh, from time to time, um, I will uh, kind of lift the chiller up and down. And what that does is that you can actually get an insulated uh, uh, heat insulation on the chiller. <clears throat> so we're chilling with uh, heat exchange. So we're sending cold water in through the coil, circulating around, and then it's going to be taking the heat from the uh, wart and then expelling it out the back. Well, what happens is that you can actually get a, a small film of super cooled wart around the coils themselves, and it can actually trap uh, and insulate against the heat exchange. So by moving the chiller uh, from time to time, you're getting rid of that heat or that insulating uh, water blanket on the coils, and you actually will chill a lot faster from time to time. Wow, it's good, so. to, good to know. Little yeah. tips and tricks, right? That's, That's right. Figure it out as you go. Or? So this should take about, uh, you know, 20 minutes or so, I'm guessing. I'm already down to 190, you know, so yeah. um, it actually could be a lot sooner, depending. Yeah, so what do, what do we do after this? I mean, we put it in a fermenter and pitch some yeast and... Yeah, um, so basically um, I have my uh, stainless steel brew bucket. I still need to sanitize it, of course, because now that we're chilling and boiling is done, we need to sanitize everything that touches the wort. So we'll fill this guy up, um, attach an airlock, um, uh, we'll pitch the yeast, and then um, I'm going to take this home and uh, put it in my fermentation chamber. Uh, because we're now at the time of year where ambient temperatures can be a little hot, um, it's a great time of year to start doing thinking about your Belgians and Saisons. Um, but if you're trying to get a good, clean fermentation from a neutral yeast, um, you really want to keep your beer in the high 60s, uh, mid to high 60s. Um, any hotter than that at the initial uh, fermentation can cause some esters mm -hmm. and some fruity flavors to shine through. So if you want that, that's great. Um, actually, a few years ago, I did a, uh, an IPA with you know the Chico Strain flagship, yeah. and uh, it was 85 degrees in the house. And I did not have my fermentation chamber at that point. 
And I basically took an American West Coast IPA and made a huge Belgian IPA, <laughs> not trying for it. It wasn't the greatest, but yeah. Um, yeah so, you know, I, I made a fermentation chamber uh, fairly easily. Um, uh, well, I have a few, um, but it's a good way just to keep the temperature of the fermentation locked in at like 65. That's what I'm gonna start yeah. off at. Um, I'll slowly over the course of a few days let it go up. I might finish it off at 72 just to, you know, have the yeast really eat everything up and clean up. Um, but that's at the end. Uh, you really want to have a good restrained temperature uh, at the beginning for this style of beer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, with that. so if you want to make this beer a Belgian, just ferment it a little higher. Yeah. Or use the Belgian yeast. Or but. use the Belgian yeast. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then I'm guessing, you know, I'll probably dry hop it after a week or so. Um, and then, uh, you know, I like to give these a little bit of time. You know, fresh is always good, but you want to give it a little bit of time. So, uh, you know, three weeks, Okay. you know, this yeah. will be quote unquote done. There we go. Um, so yeah, so we'll All probably right. do a tasting note at some point uh, with these. Yeah, we'll do a follow-up. I think the plan is to do follow-up episodes um, where we do revisit the beers that we've brewed before. Great. And yeah. Maybe get ideas for the next one. Get ideas for the next one and go, hey, you know, maybe we'd like to do this one next. So if you have, if you have some ideas for a style of beer to do next, yeah, we are, we would love to show you how to brew any style. I think uh, Tony would probably want us to do a, the Hot Pocket, a Hot Pocket Hazy or something like that, maybe. Or, uh, with pepperoni or something? Yeah, yeah. With, uh, with some pepperoni. Hot Pocket goes. You know, if, if that is the case, I might have to do a pepperoni pineapple uh, a pepperoni beer, because he's beer. all about not putting pineapple on pizza. So, so we'll put it in the beer instead. We'll put it in the beer with pepperoni. So and see a little, how he likes little it. spicy, a little that's, sweet. That's right. Yeah, the best of both worlds. I actually think that would be an amazing beer. It could be really good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. Peppercorns, pepperoni, and pineapple. The triple P. The triple P. <laughs> <laughs> the triple P pale. There yeah. you go. <clears throat> Thanks, Tony. All right, so we're already down, just by doing that, I was at 160 and just moving this around got us down to 135. Wow. So. Yeah. And the other thing too I wanna say is that you don't have to blast water through a chiller. You want a nice, not too slow, but you want it to go through at a simple rate so it gives it time to actually do the heat exchange. If you're blasting cold water through, you're not gonna get as efficient mm. heat exchange. So this is pretty good. Yeah, 130. So we're, we're dropping pretty quick. The time that takes the longest is 100 degrees down to 70. Yeah. That's always the, the time on that one. Yeah, a lot of times what I do is I uh, pre-boil some water and then freeze it and add frozen, oh, that's a good frozen idea. water to top off to my volume. Yeah, I like that. And then it kind of chills it a little bit quicker. and Because mm -hmm. my, my chiller's a little, a little smaller than yours. but. Yeah, I got this one specifically because I like to do 10 gallon batches, right, yeah. um, which is fun if you want to do this. Uh, the option of a 10 gallon is fun because, you know, for example, I put in uh, beers to competitions and stuff like that. Right. So it's good to do five, split it into two different yeasts, maybe dry hop one to the other, play with different uh, ingredients and different all that Different fermentation kind of stuff. temperatures. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of fun to do all that kind of stuff, so. That's part of the fun of the hobby, though, right? That's to, right. To play around and you can get, do whatever get a you want. Creative and yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. We could. We could. Uh, we got a couple minutes here, so we'll show uh, another hop stories video. Um, and when we come back, we'll be pretty much done and ready to. This might be gone too. Put it in the fermenter. All right. We'll see you in a little bit. On brew day. Oh, brew day. Oh, at. That we play at the brewery. Oh, what music! Oh, f Grateful Dead almost exclusively. Tribe Call Quest all day. Tom Petty Radio. 80s and 90s pop songs. They're Madonna really loudly. If you're brewing, you need something that just like puts a smile on your face, like lovely day. You know, like typically something that's very upbeat. A lot of hip hop. Summer hits of the 90s. It depends on who plugs their phone in first. Either epic theme songs or random Disney show tunes. Musical soundtracks, I don't, I don't understand why. The theme uh, of the music is always based on what we're brewing that day. We've got a Belgian blonde that we might put on some bluegrass for, but we also have a beer called The Butcher, which is an imperial stout, and we'll put on death metal for it. 
if you, if you want like a slow fermentation, you play the Beethoven, the slow stuff, and then if you want like, you know, you throw on that pop, the oont, oont, the EDM music for the really high ABV stuff. It definitely works. The yeast really uh, absorbs those like reggae vibes and uh, really helps them like give a nice smooth beer. In the mornings, we might have like some slow jazz or some Enya, and then we'll ramp it up to about some alternative. I prefer Sade, everyone else prefers dark metal music. <laughs> Hello. So Jesse was uh, cleaning out the fermenter, just so we have a nice, nice house for the yeast to, to kind of live in while they're chewing up to some of this beer. And we were talking a little bit about what, what the next steps are. So just to kind of fill you guys in, we, we are brewing a pale ale today, just a Northwest pale ale. Uh, we are chilling, so we did a mash, we did a boil, and now we're just letting it get down to temperature so that the yeast won't just burn up. <laughs> yeah. The worst thing you can do is put fresh yeast into a really, really hot wort. Yeah. Before it has a chance. Yeah, so talk about what you're doing, what you're doing right now to kind of sanitize. Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, this is a stainless steel fermenter bucket uh, that I got at uh, Micro Homebrew. Um, I used both plastic uh, buckets um, and then uh, glass carboys, um, but I like the, uh, I saved and I was able to get the stainless steel because it's a little bit easier to uh, clean. Um, you can wash it, it, it might not have the pitting uh, that uh, plastic can ha also have. And also, if you leave things in plastic, um, there can be a diffusion of oxygen into your uh, finished beer, which is not always a good thing. Um, so I went in and kind of splurged, got the stainless steel uh, guy right here. So I filled it up with a little bit of water, got some star sand, which is a no rinse sanitizer. Um, and so I'm going to put that in here and kind of splash it around. Let's see, make sure this is on correctly. Okay, perfect. Because once again, we only want the yeast enjoying the wort, nothing else. So uh, I just kind of get it in there and then just kind of splash it around, make sure every surface is in contact. And uh, the star stain will foam up and there is always this adage saying don't fear the foam. Um, it's good because it takes the oxygen out and stuff like that, but it makes sure it gets to everything. So that's a good example of that. So I'm just gonna let that sit. Uh, I have my airlock that will uh, put sanitizer in and uh, put that in the the little guy right there um, once this is chilled. Uh, looks like we're at 115 so I'm gonna bounce this around and like I said I'm gonna uh, ferment this at about 65 degrees for the first week or so uh, first you know five to seven days uh, and then depending on where it's at, I'll probably let it ramp up to like 68, 70 degrees, um, kind of finish off, do what's called a diacetyl rest. If diacetyl was produced by the yeast, um, by letting it warm up, the yeast will actually eat um, that diacetyl and clean it up for you. So the best thing you can do is just have patience and time the yeast will work for you. Otherwise, if you don't give it patience, then you have to do extra work to take all the stuff that it would have already done for you. Um, so uh, after letting it rise up and sitting there for a day or two, I'll then go ahead and cold crash it um, and get it down to about 40 degrees. Uh, and that will basically make the dry hops I've added and any other stuff, uh, the yeast or any other stuff floating around get really cold and drop out and my beer will get really clear. Um, cold crashing is a really good uh, method of doing that with any kind of beer. Um, if I was going to make this a lager, it's still a cold crash, but then I would just let the beer sit uh, and lager uh, for a few weeks uh, to a few months, uh, right around 34 degrees or so, depending. And then it'll be ready to drink. Um, let's see. Yeah, so that's uh, 95 degrees. So we're getting there. Like that. Um, I actually was able to kind of do a test batch of this beer um, 
a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, I, we cha I changed a few things up with it, but it's pretty pretty close, so I do have a bottle of uh, uh, for us to try at some point uh, uh, before we close out with you guys um, and give you a tasting notes. I'm not sure if it's carbonated all the way, but um, we'll, we will see. But it's pretty good. Let's see. Yeah, so, you know, we're still right around 92, so it's going to take a little bit more time. This is always the longest part of getting down to try to get down to 75. Um, <clears throat> now, if I wanted to uh, not pitch the yeast, which we will show you pitching the yeast, and uh, I also brought my oxygenation stone and tank to kind of show you that. Um, like I said, you could always, you know, just make sure you're getting a lot of suds and uh, aerating. There are some people that go back and forth from bucket to bucket that works, um, but I just like the simplicity and ease of the oxygen tank and stone. 30 to 60 seconds of pure oxygen in there. And uh, what pure oxygen, or what oxygen does for yeast in general, is it allows the yeast to actually develop a really thick membrane. Um, this is really important for high gravity beers because that osmotic pressure from the sugary uh, environment uh, can be stressful to the yeast and actually break some of their membranes. So if you give them enough oxygen, it gives them a good defense to start eating away uh, and not stressing out. So um, I just like to do it in general because healthy yeast is really good. Plus. I'm probably actually going to be uh, utilizing this yeast cake again for the next beer. Um, I think my plan overall was to actually brew a really good IPA, like a probably 7 percenter. Um, and so because of that, I'm going to be starting off at 1065 gravity, maybe a little higher. Um, so I am actually kind of utilizing this batch as a yeast starter batch so that I have a really good healthy yeast colony ready to chew away at a good IPA in about a week and a half or so. Um, so that's also kind of a fun thing you can do uh, when it comes to yeast as well. Let's kind of grow it up in a smaller beer for the next big one um, on that. <clears throat> and then I might use it again. Uh, I've been kind of hankering for a barley wine. I haven't made one in a long time. Um, and I have a lot of hops uh, at home that are kind of been, uh, they're older and kind of been sitting in my uh, freezer for a long time. And so I kind of want to do like a, you know, uh, a big barley wine with all these different hops in it and just see what happens, um, which is kind of a fun thing to do. Um, clean and shop, basically. So while we uh, let this finish chilling, should we break out the, the beer that you yeah, did? Yeah, yeah. So I have it right here. This is the other thing that is very important. We got a bottle opener. Right here. I was going to say I have one oh, right here. Oh, you got here one on your on the brew stand. On the brew stand with its own magnet that catches oh, wow. your uh, beer caps. So well, that's beautiful. All right, that's good for me. Want something? Uh, got a glass? Yeah, I'll finish this. All right. So this is fairly young. It's only about two weeks old. So. But um, has really good clarity on it. Uh, good nose. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you thinking on this one? Yeah, I definitely can smell the Cascade and Centennial on it. Still kind of has a green flavor to it, but it does. But that, that's that's a nice greenness. Like yeah. I've had some beers that are just like, ugh, like burns your tongue as you drink it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very pleasant. Uh -huh. You know, it, this will this will mature in another week or so. Yeah. I got the keg, you know, over at uh, Flying Bike, um, and uh, you know, I'm guessing in about a week and a half, two weeks, this will mellow. The malt will kind of come through a little bit. That greenness will die off, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, it's already a really good tasting beer. It's, yeah, it's just yeah, a it's a good pale ale. It's it's a beer that I'd I'd have a, a couple of definitely. Yeah. And as you can see, it's a little dark, but. The pale ale has a wide range of color. Like you can, you know, think of like Dale's pale ale. That's a really dark pale ale. Mm. Um, utilizes a lot of uh, darker caramel malts. Yeah, in it. yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, 
it's you know it's it's kind of the thing I, like I really like and I get this with uh, Sierra Nevada is that Cascade it just has a really good refreshingness to mm. it. You know, um, it kind of even though it's hot out, it kind of cools you off a little it bit. It does. You know? It does definitely. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> but yeah, and that's why I use Horizon because you can kind of taste the Cascade bitterness. It's got that little kind of residual bite to it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, um, sometimes if you use a, a bittering hop that has even more bite, it can kind of be a little, little much. Okay. You yeah. Know? So the Horizon's just kind of a mellow, yeah, bittering hop. Gives you the bitterness without the, the bite. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, I can't wait to see what this one I know. turns out like too. I know. And if you're if you're planning on brewing this recipe, let us know how it works for you. Um, we'd love to hear. All right, we're down to 80, so we're getting close. Getting close. I'm just swapping out the nipple that I had on my, uh, uh, whatchamacallit thing here. Um, because when I go from the mash tun, it's the same barb, so I want to be able to use the same hose. Uh, and then I go to the bigger one right here. So, But because we're already chilled, I want to make sure that I sanitize it and put it on there. So then we're still safe and good. Still there. So this is the type of or time of the brew day when things start winding down. You've been brewing for a while. You might have had a beer or two, and things are just kind of nice and easy going. You know, no need to rush. Just kind of relax. Yeah, there's no no fire going anymore. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a little bit of a breeze. So just yeah, breeze really has nice. picked up. Yeah. <sighs> So, uh, you know, we put it out to the people, you know, what, uh, if they might want to give us some suggestions on beer styles that we want, might want to do. What, do you, what would you like uh, for us to do down the road, do you think? Well, I, I mean, I think doing a, a <clears throat> simple beer, like a pale ale, is, is nice, but I'd like to just do something weird. I don't know, use non-traditional ingredients or something like that. For sure. I mean, yeah. I don't want to make it so that we have, like, a hellish brew day. But well, I think there's ways we can uh, make you know things interesting yeah. for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Use a different yeast. Uh, you know, like I said, I like kind of blending different hops together. Um, besides your standards, we kind of went very traditional with today. Right, right. Um, but uh, it'd be kind of fun to actually do the same pale ale recipe at some point and then swap out the hops. Um, you know, maybe some New Zealand Nelson Sauvin or Galaxy or. Something like that. Do a, do a brute IPA. Or, brute, yeah. A brute, brute pale ale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or hazy. Yep. Just maybe use the same base malts and then swap the hops and see what happens and yeah. see how that can really change the recipe. Or mm -hmm. use the same hops and switch the malts and get a big barley wine or something like that from the same. Ooh, I like that. Hops. Yeah. Cascade Centennial. It'd also be fun to split a batch too. I have some uh, three gallon carboys uh, okay, yeah. that I could uh, split and then do maybe like a barbarian versus Chico strain or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That'd be kind of fun. Especially if we do like the hazy or. Or do, a, do a hazy lager. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds good. I like that idea. I love lagers myself. Um, it's funny, it's, it's a style. Of beer that a lot of homebrewers think is like beyond them, but it really isn't. Um, it's, you know, unless you have a fermentation chamber now, it might be a little bit hard. But once right. we get into the winter months, it's really easy to do your own lagers. Um, 
and uh, it's it's really interesting to see the different profiles. And I found that you know, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, logger, logger this, logger that, because right. we kind of get bogged down with Budweiser and all those kind of guys. But um, <clears throat> you know, there's one thing when I have a Pilsner or a Maybach or something like that on tap. It's gone pretty fast. So, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, easy drinking beers. Drink, drink quicker. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I made the mistake of uh, um, I won best of show with a pilsner, but it was like right when my wife found out she was pregnant, so she couldn't have any. And that's I brewed it specifically for her because she oh. loves like German <laughs> pilsners. And then of course it won best of show, and she couldn't have it. <laughs> She's like. You gotta brew it again. <laughs> so I, I'll have to do that soon, sooner than later. Yeah, and we had we had talked about um, going to the artesian well and getting our water yeah. from there. Yeah, yeah. Doing a batch of beer with that. Um, yeah. Um, for I don't know those of you who are not familiar, we have a really good uh, water source uh, up in Linwood, right off of 164th Avenue and I-5 there. Um, it's uh, an artesian well that goes down, and it's actually melt water from the Olympics going underneath the sound, and then it's tapped right there in Linwood. And uh, I've made some, that Best of Show Pilsner was yeah. actually made with that. Um, and uh, yeah, the water is, is pretty darn good. Um, another uh, brewer out there, Keith Ciani. Uh, he was featured on a Chop and Brew episode okay. at one point. Yeah. Um, he's really big down in Olympia now. Uh, he won, uh, I think it was the 2016 uh, Homebrew, National Homebrewers Competition. He won uh, his uh, he won with uh, his pilsner that was made with the Artesian Well in Olympia. Oh really? And he, his his thing was it's the water. That was it's what he said. Water. It was the water. So I actually took that out of his book and made my beer with our artesian well and yeah. all that. Granted, it wasn't the National Homebrew Competition, but right, but it's still yeah, yeah. still. But there's something to be said. Water is pretty much what beer is. 90% of beer. Yeah. 98%. All right. So, uh, you know, we're at 75. Um, we could wait to go, you know, a little lower. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to let this sit. I'm going to keep it, let it chilling, but I'm not going to move it around. Okay. Um, I found that... Uh, once it gets to this point, if I just let it sit for about 10 minutes or so, um, it really gives it a chance. I Sometimes I go longer. Sometimes hmm. I even go 30 minutes to 40 minutes. We're not going to do that today because we're under, we're live and we got people watching and all that kind of stuff. But um, I found that when I do that, it really gives the wort to settle out and I get oh. a really good fine mat of trub. Yeah. And literally, like, I'll lift this up and you can see through the wort to the trub some oh, of wow. the times. Um, and so what, that, what I then do is I take my little uh, pitcher over there, I pull off the first, you know, quart. Yeah. Um, not even usually, and that's usually all trub, but because I have a dip tube on the bottom, it makes a small divot in that uh, trub um, okay. on there. And it basically all of that clean wort flows right over that in in, and then I get cleaner, crystal clear wort going oh, into wow. my fermenter. Yeah. And as soon as I started doing that, I've been doing that for almost three years now, um, that homebrew taste kind of went away, which is right. really nice. And then yeah. when I stopped doing it, that homebrew taste came back a little bit. <laughs> um, and if you ask, what is that homebrew taste? It's really hard to... Overly caramel and... Yeah, there's just, you know, it's like, uh, it's not funky, but it's funky. Like, it's just, it's earthy, but not earthy. It's really hard to describe, but as a homebrewer, you kind of know, you have to taste it in order right, to understand right. it, you know. Um, but if you're, you know, struggling with that flavor, there are certain things um, that I think I've demonstrated for you today that will help you get away from that flavor and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and that's just because I've just been brewing a lot over the last few years, and it's worked for me. And it might not work for you, but at least it worked for me, and it might be something that might help you uh, down the road um, with that. So. Yeah, and if you've if you've missed any part of today, uh, I mean, we've been live streaming for over three hours. Almost four hours now. Um, yeah. The video will be saved on the Facebook page, so at the end of the stream you can hop back and kind of skip through if you want and yeah. pick up the parts that you missed. Um, 
see if you'll you'll probably learn something. I mean, I hope so. I've, <laughs> I've been home brewing for about five years, and I've definitely learned a lot today just from hanging out with another home brewer and brewing a batch of beer. So for sure, yeah. And I will say, you know, uh, you know, take this uh, with you as well. You know, uh, if this is uh, has inspired you, find another buddy that home brews and brew with them. If you haven't done it already, it's a great experience. You might forget a thing or two, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, because most of us brew alone. Yeah. And we kind of have our system, but it, there is something to be said with brewing another person. Um, it, yeah, it, you might see something you might not have even thought of. Um, yeah, definitely. And I've learned that at uh, the homebrew days that we've had at the shop and stuff like that, brewing with a bunch of other people. And I'm like, oh, I didn't, never even thought of that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. All right, where are we at? All right. Um, I think we're pretty much there for the most part. So right. um, let's see. I am... I'll grab that bottle out of your way. Oh, great. I think so you don't have to worry about spilling it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour this water out. And then I'm going to pour the sanitizer in here so that I have some for my airlock. So smarter, not harder, Jesse. That's what I always remember. So let's, instead of fighting with this thing, why don't I just do it this way? There we go. I will say that is the nice thing about these uh, fermenters is that they do have a valve on them. So when it comes to transferring your beer, it makes life a lot easier. Okay, so we got my sanitizer right there. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, splash this up again and then we'll pour it out. And this would be the same thing if you're, you know, if you have, uh, oops, don't want the stopper all the in there. Um, if you had a plastic bucket or even a carboy, um, plastic or uh, glass, you know, just get the sanitizer, splash it around. There you go. I'm just gonna pour this right out here. All right, once again, they say don't fear the foam. It's not gonna hurt. You wanna get most of your uh, sanitizer out, I mean, obviously. Um, but you know, if there's a small residual amount, that's fine too. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, like I said, I'm gonna catch the first amount coming, let's see. So then it, until it starts running clear, Pretty good. There we go. The other thing too is, uh, like I said, with the your pots, uh, make sure your valve is closed on your fermenter um, if you have one, because you don't want it running out all over the floor after all of that hard work. Um, okay, so let's take a reading. Got the trusty refractometer here, and just splash. That's all you need. All right, 1057. So that's exactly where we needed to be. So that's perfect. So there we go. Right on track. Um, the wort is coming out really nice. Uh, not full of gunk. Now, um, when it comes to extract, you know, you're kind of limited with what you have. I always say if you can, after chilling, siphon the beer out of your, uh, uh, your boil kettle and try to leave as much of the trub behind as you can. Um, I found, yes, a little bit of trub is okay and they say it's, you know, food for the yeast and all that, but honestly there's enough food in the beer or the wort already. Um, and, you know, the hops and the grain material and the proteins can lead to off flavors, maybe that home brew taste. Um, so, you know, trying to leave as much of that behind is just going to result like I said, a cleaner wart, clean wart means clean beer uh, for the most part. So, um, yeah. And then we'll go ahead and open this up. So, uh, if you want to take a look on camera, this is essentially what the wart is like. You can see it's kind of frothed up a little bit, but it's really clear on top there. 
Um, if I was to take my spoon, which I'm not going to because it's not sanitary anymore, um, you could actually see the wart is really nice and crystal clear um, with that. So um, relatively speaking, you know, that was a pretty good chill time. Um, you know, yeah, I think this has uh, been a pretty good brew day so far. Um, I'm really excited for this beer. Um, so yeah, so uh, with the valve open, with the higher uh, uh, gauge nipple, it's coming up pretty fast, so um, it's doing a good job at uh, draining. And then we'll be able to oxygenate, and then uh, Could you east. start oxygenating right now? I could, yeah. Um, yeah, so... See what or is there any benefit to doing it earlier rather than later or anything like that? So, I mean, I typically uh, do it once I have my levels. Mm -hmm. um, I have noticed at Flying Bike that Kevin uh, will start oxygenating when he's about halfway to two-thirds of the way uh, filled in his fermenter. Okay. So he doesn't do it right from the get-go, yeah. but he'll start oxygenating... Um, you know, fairly towards the end as he's pumping the wort in. Hmm. He already has the yeast in there and all that kind of stuff. So I will say as a home brewer now working at a professional brewery, it's really interesting to see the commonalities of brewing in general, but there are some different things, you yeah. know, from pro or from home brew to pro brew. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just, you know, this is your standard uh, one uh, pound oxygen tank. And then I have a regulator with diffusion stone. And then I just kind of go right in there and then, um, it's kind of harder to see because it's foamy, um, but I just turn it on and I don't go full bore. Um, I just, you know, because if you go full bore and it's, uh, you know, obviously bubbling up a lot, well, you're bubbling oxygen out of your wart. So if you just do a nice steady amount um, for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, not even, um, that's all you need. So there we go. And there's still a little bit of oxygen in the line coming out of the diffusion stone, so I'm just gonna rinse that off into the wort. There we go. Uh, the one thing I will say is that if you have a diffusion stone, don't touch the stone. Uh, the small openings and pores of the stone uh, can get clogged very easily by the oils on our skin. So even though we don't see the oils, they will still clog your diffusion stone. Um, so, you know, be uh, mindful uh, of that. So on the inside of this, uh, 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 fermenter it actually has etched uh, graduations as well, which makes things a lot easier. Um, so I can actually see where we're at. Uh, looks like we're about four gallons, so we want to get up to about five and a half. So, but I think we're we'll go pretty good um, in here. The other thing I also noticed is that leaving the chiller in there kind of uh, creates a dam for the chub, um, and so you know it will uh, get you better extraction, yeah. so you have less loss. But you know, calculate for your loss. You'll, you'll figure it out after a few batches, but as long as you have a good calculation, then your gravities will be on point. Um, you'll have the right IBUs and you won't have a loss of, uh, uh, of overall wart that you could get. Um, you know, yeah. But see that really good mat of, uh, of trub in there? Can do the notch. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm just like, ah. so cool. Yeah, I found the dip tube is just a really, I've done like, you know, the bazooka screen in the boil kettle. Usually you yeah. do it in a mash tun. Mm -hmm. I've done that, but it usually gets clogged Clog, up yeah. and it's just, it still pulls. I, for some reason, the dip tube and letting it settle just always, I mean, this wort coming out is just crystal clear, right. um, which is perfect. What is that? Oh, there we go. Cool. <clears throat> All right. So, and then of course today we're using Imperial's flagship. I'm gonna get that just out and ready. 
since we're almost to the point of volume. Um, I am digging their new packaging. Um, you know, people had problems with the the cans and all that kind of stuff. I figured it, you know, you just don't shake it. And then I would always have like a, a fork or something like that and sanitizer ready to scrape off the bottom. But the new packaging is a is a plus. Um, you don't have to worry about it potentially foaming up on you or blowing up in your face, which I never had it blow up in my face. But um, the people over Imperial are really, have been really gracious uh, to me personally. Um, and uh, they also um, sponsor my classes from time to time. I did an IPA class at the end of uh, April and they sponsored all of the yeast. And I made six batches of beer um, for that class. And uh, they gave me the yeast for not only those beers, but also the weird beer that we brewed. And uh, they'll probably also be uh, helping me out down the road this fall when I start uh, up my classes again. So stay tuned uh, for the Brosa School of Brewing. Um, I should have a schedule within the next, I'm hoping, week or so. Um, I just got to talk to uh, Karen Brewing where I do the classes and uh, see what works for them. Uh, they've been very gracious to me. Those are great guys. They just got uh, five medals at the Washington Beer Festival. Um, uh, Bill did. So uh, if you haven't checked them out, they're a great little brewery in the Kenmore area. Um, I'm always tempted to tip this thing to make it go faster, but whenever I do, then it starts, the wort starts getting dirty again. But we're almost there, so I'm gonna cheat. But I'd say that overall, this has been a very successful brew day. We hit all of our numbers perfectly, um, which, you know, if you're a home brewer, you know that sometimes this doesn't always happen. Um, you kind of just roll with the punches, but uh, for a live brew session, talking to you guys, uh, you fine folks out there, um, I'm pretty proud of this brew day. Perfect. All right, and uh, yeah, so the rest is loss, um, which is fine. Um, we calculated for that, so I'm gonna go ahead and Pour a little bit of sanitizer over the pouch. Um, let's do it over here. Just so that, you know, by touching it and anything that might get into the beer, it won't. So that's good to go. I also got my hands a little bit, so then you can do this. So um, let's see here. This right over here so you guys can see it. So it's pretty full up. And uh, I've already massaged the yeast into the liquid and so I'm just going to go ahead and pitch this Bam. and then get all the remains every little bit counts okay attach the top fill the airlock And we're done. So that's the brew day right there. Uh, this is ready to go into a, a fermentation chamber, or if you don't have one, you got a cool place around the house, closet somewhere that stays in the mid 60s, perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, this is ready to become beer. The yeast is gonna get to work and uh, we'll be enjoying this in a few weeks. So. Yeah, so uh, thanks for tuning in to our inaugural episode, our pilot episode of livebrew.tv uh, from Hop Stories. We're yeah. going to be trying to do one of these about once a month and uh, we'll see you know, what, what recipes we end up doing next. If Again, if you have a suggestion or you'd like to see something, if you'd like to learn how to do a certain technique in home brewing or a certain way to do it, um, we're always happy to include that in some of our next episodes, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's how to get into home brewing, how to how to shop at a homebrew store. Oh yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. How to build a recipe, stuff like that. We'd love, we'd love to share that information with you guys. So make sure to check out Abrosis School of Home Brewing. School of Brewing. School of Brewing. <laughs> Abrosis School of Brewing yep. on Facebook. Uh, we'll make sure we tag everyone that's been involved today. Uh, Imperial Yeast, Yak uh, Yakima Valley Hops. Did yeah, you get some Yakima hops from Valley there? Hops. Yep. 
Um, and then Skagit Valley Malting with a malt. Uh, and we are going to be doing this again soon. Yeah. So Stay tuned. Next, next time we'll make sure to, to let everyone know a little bit ahead of time. Uh, this one was very much trying to figure it out. So that's it for today for livebrew.tv. And let us know what you want to see next time, yeah. and we'll get it going. And we'll see you at HomebrewCon. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Cheers. <laughs>